client is Assalamu alaikum sir. Hey, walikum assalam. How are you doing? Happy, happy yeah. Bangla Nabo Borsho sir. I wish I could speak Bangla really well. <laughs> yes sir. You know, today is the second day of Bangla New Year. Oh, congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Sir, happy. So I already sent through WhatsApp group to you, Bangla Nabo Borsho and happy birthday sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, happy Bangla Day. Uh, I don't know if that's the way you say it. Yes. So is this the Independence Day or is it the New Year? Day? No, no, it, what, it is the, day? according to Bangla calendar, it is ah. the first day of ah. the Bangla year. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. So is it public holiday? Uh, it was a public holiday, but uh, uh -huh. I went to the hospital today as well. Are you are you in the theater today or are you are you I can see your cap mask? No 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 sir. My hair was being you know was swirling with the fan air. So I am wearing this to <laughs> okay. get rid oh, of that. So you're, oh you are not you are not in the theater. I thought you were operating or something. No today I went to the hospital. I operated uh -huh. yesterday, but today there was no operation. We had a discussion simply. So for a change, you can walk, you can drive through uh, Dhaka without any traffic, huh? Yeah, very, very smooth, sir. <laughs> the last time, it took me four hours to get from the hospital to the airport from Dhaka. Right, right. Quite difficult situation. All right. So we are getting there. It's 1657. Happy, happy birthday, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I had a great, uh, I had a great uh, day yesterday, actually. Yes, sir. Uh, it was very nice. A lot of people wished me, and then yes. uh, my kids really enjoyed it. So, yes, sir. We had a, we had a big karaoke session last night. <laughs> oh, the great day, sir. Yes, I told I, you. I wish wife, if I would be close to you, then I would attend you with my greetings and you know, yes, of course, some yes. note of <laughs> note of love. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are all stuck at home, so we have to yes, make sir. the best of the situation. My children are... are Yesterday, are one of our uh, specialists in medicine, a doctor from a medical college, he's a faculty of a medical college, he died. Because oh of... my God, don't talk about it. It's so worrying. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. It's a very, and, very bad uh, situation. But we have to go on with this. Oh, what to do? What to right. Do? It's a very difficult situation. What to do? We just have very to difficult. hang on very there. Yeah. Right. But it was it was fun to to be with at home with the family after a very long time. So it was good. We, we I am ad advising my relatives to read Quran with meaning and tafsir so that they get understanding Inshallah. and they can. Inshallah. That's the way. Yeah, I'm that's to the best way. Out. Guys. Yeah, that's the best way. Out. You have to do something religious which keeps your mind at right. peace. That's the most important and thing. Whatever you read, and it's okay, teaching. but. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. So we are getting ready for this talk. Uh, one more minute to go. So I'll just wait. Okay, uh, more sir. people are joining. I, I got the privilege to house. get you and see you. <laughs> always, always a pleasure, sir. Thank always you. a pleasure. And I'm so impressed with your dedication to education. That you're there. You don't need to Thank be you. here, but you're Thank there. You, <laughs> I love to read and to love to learn. Yeah, a lot of residents who should be on the forum are not there. They are out there sitting at home doing something. God knows what. Right. But, sir. Person, yeah. but anyway, it's good. Good to know that we can do that. All right. Everybody on board. Is Nikhil here or not here? I got Nikhil is there. Yes, sir. Yes. Hi. Okay. Good. Good. Yes, you are there. Good to see you. You are the. You have to be there. Everybody else can go away, but you cannot go away. <laughs> yes, sir. You're, you're not allowed to go. You have to stay till the end. Yes, sir. No matter, how, no matter how bored you are, you have to stay till the end. <laughs> People are already feeling jealous of him, sir. <laughs> oh, are they? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> he will because tell you how strict I am. <laughs> you are jealous, I think. <laughs> You are jealous. <laughs> Let, let's get on with this uh, lecture. So good, good. Welcome everybody. Uh, remind me to record. Record. Most important. Remind Can't me to record. record. So let's start sharing my desktop. Okay. So everybody can see my desktop. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And then the important thing is to start to record. Okay. Otherwise, that will be a disaster. Where the hell is the record button? I got record on this computer. Okay, all right. So today's talk is actually a very basic talk, but it's surprisingly very important. I, I, I'm surprised how many people get this wrong in the exam. I promise you, this is this one and insertion of an intercostal chest drain. These are the two places where a lot of people get it wrong. And it is something that you do every day in your career. So the problem is if you get it wrong, then people will question you severely, okay? So I think it's quite important uh, to make sure that uh, you know this topic inside out. Everything possible you must know about it. But before I, I, I start my lecture, today's lecture is actually dedicated to my student, okay? And my most important thing is this young boy, okay? Kamran Ali uh, started training with me, uh, I don't know, five, seven, eight years ago six, seven years ago. He came to me as a young uh, graduate, uh, did not know uh, even how to put in a chest drain. And today, just hot off the press, he sent me an image saying, sir, I have done my first independent lung uh, retrieval in uh, Austria. So I am so proud of him. As he was getting onto the flight, he, he, he phoned me and he sent me a message saying, sir, you're the first person I want you to know that this is what I did today. So I am really feeling very, very proud. As a proud father, I'm sitting here. So this lecture is dedicated to Kamran. Uh, very proud of what he has achieved and really an ideal student. I mean, honestly, his success in life has been perfect. So the whole lecture is for him. Okay. All right. So let's talk about alveolar air leak. Um, alveolar air leak, it's important to understand what is alveolar air leak. It's important to understand what is persistent air leak. It's important to understand what is bronchopleural fistula, okay? A lot of people make this mistake. I, I have a lot of people phoning me saying, the patient's got bronchopleural fistula, what should I do? But actually, there is a difference between a alveolar air leak, a difference between a persistent air leak, and a difference between a bronchopleural fistula. So any parenchymal leak, distal to the segmental bronchus into the pleura is called as alveolar air leak, okay? 
And that happens in about 50 to 65% of lung resection patients. And it is quite important that before you finish your surgery, before you get out of theater, uh, before you start closing, you must actually on table do a water puncture test. And I'll show you this video a bit later, I think. So everybody on table must, before you finish doing uh, thoracic surgery, uh, before closing the chest, you must put in water into the chest and allow the lung to re-expand to make sure there is no air leak. And then depending upon what is the grade of air leak that you get, you decide whether you need to do close it surgically or put in some sealant or something like that. And we'll discuss all that in a minute, okay? All right. So I'm sorry my, my animations have gone haywire because I didn't check the presentation before. So as I said, uh, alveolar air leak versus bronchopleural fistula is very important to differentiate. Any parenchymal leak distal to the segmental bronchus, as I just told you, is alveolar air leak. It is not BPF, okay? Anything that comes from a segmental bronchus upwards all the way up to a pneumonectomy stump is a bronchopleural fistula. So there is a huge difference in understanding the two concepts because when you understand the two concepts is when you understand what uh, are the treatments because treatments of the two are completely different. So if you talk bronchopleural fistula, you are making a huge mistake you will not treat it the way an alveolar air leak needs to be treated, okay? So everything that I talk about is going to be around these two uh, numbers. And there is a third concept called as prolonged or persistent air leak. For me, a prolonged air leak is flow more than 20 ml per minute over 24 hours or an instantaneous more than 200 ml per minute after five days of surgery, okay? Uh, can you just switch off your microphones, please? Whoever is there, I tried to switch it off, but somebody switched it back on. Switch off your microphones, please. Okay, that's good. All right. Okay, so this is important to understand what is alveolar air leak, what is prolonged air leak, and what is bronchopleural fistula. Okay, all right. Uh, literature, there is a wide variety of uh, papers. Some people talk about seven days, some people talk about 10 days, some people talk about various things. But if you look at the STS database, the STS database defines uh, prolonged air leak as something that lasts for more than five days after surgery. So my suggestion to everybody would be that all the other definitions are historic we must now look at the latest definition. STS has the largest data coming into uh, its uh, database. So we must, all of us should use the same terminology around the world. So whenever you tell somebody on the phone that, sir, this patient has got prolonged air leak, I'm automatically assuming that he's more than five days post-surgery or more than five days post-insertion of an ICD. So it's important to understand this this definition, quite important. The incidence of prolonged or persistent air leak is 9.7 to 15% of all air leaks, okay? So we said that about 50 to 60% of patients have air leaks after thoracic surgery. Out of this 50%, about 9% uh, will actually go on to become prolonged air leaks. So before we talk about air leaks, we must understand what is grading of air leaks. There are two or three types of grading. Uh, clinically, if you look at Macarini's paper, um, I think 2012, uh, he talks, he grades the air leak like this. And this is important for the exam, okay? Because this will come, we will ask you this in the exam. So zero is no air leak. Uh, number one is countable bubbles. Number two is a stream of bubbles. And number three is a coalesced bubbles, okay? This is Macarini's paper. This is how he's graded it. There are other papers who have also spoken about single stream, two to five discrete streams, uh, more than five or coalesced streams, okay? I, I, am, I get more and more confused with, uh, with the grading if you do more and more uh, this sort of single stream, discrete stream, because nowadays we are actually in the world of, uh, in the world of uh, digital suction devices. And in digital suction device, you can't see any of these uh, things. So for me, the best uh, grading is actually Serfolio's grading. And this, uh, again, is quite a recent paper. It got published, I think, a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And Serfolio calls it as grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. And personally, 
uh, this is more relevant to me than uh, you know bubbles and how many bubbles are coming and things like that because you really don't bend down and keep a tab on how many bubbles are coming so a grade one is called as during post expiration only so this gives you a clinical picture of what is happening so only when he's taking a deep cough and uh, you know when you ask the patient to take a deep cough you get a few bubbles that's a grade one grade two is when passively he's sitting but on expiration he's getting uh, an air leak that's grade two grade three is when he's getting inspiration okay so even on inspiration when he goes in he's getting air leak that's great and grade four is a continuous bubbling present both during inspiration and expiration so this clinically is a better way to grade if you are asked in the exam i personally would talk about macaronies and then talk about the serfolios classification of air leaks okay uh, and it is important to know these classifications otherwise uh, you know it won't look good on your this thing uh, okay again yeah please switch off your microphone yeah come on what is the problem do you want me to not allow participants to switch on microphones i can do that i've just done that so if anybody else wants to talk now you have to ask my permission but problem is i won't remember to ask that to unmute that so just please switch off your microphones please okay so where were we uh i think adnan asked me to talk about this uh, adnan uh, uh, said he was asked this exam this question in the exam so i put it in the context of this discussion just to uh, just for completion Uh, there is some suggestion of what do you do when there is a you know how do you calculate the percentage of pneumothorax uh, and uh, the standard uh, thing where you start acting is when there is more more than 20 pneumothorax or more than 3 cm gap in a pleural space uh, 38% of these there's a this straight out of the paper straight out of ESTS textbook and it says 38% improve with suction chest physiotherapy bronchodilator therapy and bronchoscopy so this actually mcq comes in the exam uh, where they ask you what is the percentage of pneumothorax and what do you do in that situation the important thing to remember is 10% of patients still have residual pneumothorax at 3 months doesn't mean that you have to put in an icd into all patients that's the important thing to understand unless the patient is clinically unwell or if there is uh, bubbling then that's different but non expansion of a lung does not actually indicate that the patient is unwell it could be that on table you didn't allow the lung to fully expand and you close the chest and then you had a space left over again if you've done a lobectomy it does take time for the lung to re expand and fill up that space so 10% of patients still have residual space at 3 months particularly when you're talking about tuberculosis surgery or aspergillus surgery you may have fibrotic lungs which may not re expand and sometimes if the patient is clinically well you accept the picture and you say it's okay all right so uh, this is the way you calculate uh, again this uh, i put in this is not part of the lecture per se but this is for uh, adnan's request uh, how do you calculate the percentage of pneumothorax so what you do is you take in the chest x ray and you draw the lines a can you see that so height and uh, width and then uh, height into width will give you a number a so you have to multiply 30 by 15 which gives you a you have to mark out the lung which is collapsed on the within the uh, thoracic cavity and then you do height and width so height into width uh, gives you b and then a minus b divided by a is the ratio and then you multiply it by 100 that gives you the percentage it's called as kirchers and swartzels uh, technique of measuring percentage of pneumothorax on a chest x ray okay it's very easy height and width multiply the two together you get a height and width of the collapsed lung you multiply the two together you get b and then a minus b divided by a into 100 gives you the percentage of uh, pneumothorax okay so that's the way to calculate pneumothorax All right, so let's get on to the topic of air leaks now. Is air leak a problem? Can we do something to reduce it? Do we have any options uh, in our hands, or is it something that we have to accept? Are there any intraoperative strategies that will help us to manage air leaks? And what are the postoperative strategies uh, that we can adopt to take care of air leaks? Air leaks are a big problem. I promise you, they are a big problem. They give rise to pain because of prolonged chest drain being inside. 
they are a source of infection because you cannot pull the chest drain out foreign body in the chest is equal to uh, pneumonia is equal to empyema so bad bad news uh, decreased mobility obviously the patient with the chest drain hanging from his side cannot move very well so there are higher risk of dvt and pe so it is not a good idea uh, and uh, uh, very often you might actually put them through extra procedures uh, and sometimes they go off and you might have to put them on mechanical ventilation and they might even need icu so it is it is a real real problem uh, you know longer drain dwell time means longer length of hospital stay and in the current scenarios where uh, you know it's so expensive to keep people in the hospital there are huge cost implications of patients staying back in hospital purely because you cannot get rid of the chest drain and of course not to talk about the psychological problems for the patient because really patients in hospital are not the best places uh, and uh, really patient need their own food at home and they need their own toilets at home so they have a huge psychological problems when they are stuck in hospital and the problem is when you come on a ward round every day and you look there and say let's wait one more day it is very demoralizing for the patient because you cannot do anything the patient cannot do anything and it's a very very frustrating situation uh and most of us as surgeons have been in this situation where we do the waitful watch technique and we we say okay okay tomorrow it will settle and then tomorrow it doesn't settle and then the next day it does it really depresses the patient and it pulls them down so air leak should be taken very seriously at every stage of your operation you must try and make sure that you get rid of air leak okay we did a analysis of our uh, lobectomy data which we published uh, khaled and me and uh, you know when we did the univariate analysis for predictors of length of hospital stay the one factor which came very strongly was air leak okay straight away so this was a very strong statistical uh, analysis and we clearly found out that in our vats lobectomy groups our results were getting skewed because there was air leak so we adapted a very stringent strategy to reduce air leak on table again a multivariate analysis came up with the same answer so it's very important to make sure that you stop air leak on table particularly when you're doing a vat surgery because the whole program of vats uh, really becomes successful when you can follow an eras guideline which means you admit the patient on the morning of the surgery you operate next morning on the ward round if there is no air leak you take the drain out and get the patient home so that your turnover increases the patient's hospital stay goes down so the whole vats program works on a concept of quick turn around in the hospital because you are investing in a lot of expensive tools uh, particularly on the robotic front uh, we we really need to work hard on this thing so it is very important for us on table to make sure that air leak stops okay uh, again every day extra in the hospital it just staying in a hospital is 600 pounds a day but if you are in an icu that's you know thousands of pounds more uh, so the hospital is actually a very expensive hotel if you if you are just sitting uh, in the hospital all day long with just an air leak but no real treatment being taken place it's really like sitting in a hotel and it is the most expensive hotel to sit in 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 the current scenario so very important to take care of air leaks so what are the intraoperative strategies how do we as surgeons doing open surgery vat surgery robotic surgery how do we make sure that these air leaks don't happen in the very first place and what do we do post operatively so everything i talk today is from literature Uh, so first and foremost as soon as i finish my operation i will insist on doing a bubble test so there i am pouring uh, pouring uh, water into my uh, saline into my chest i am uh, asking the anesthetist to reinflate and i will never close the chest till i have done this and i will get the camera up close on my bronchial stump and i want to see and make sure that there is no air leak see there this bubble would have been missed if there was no uh, water in the in the chest so it's very important that every single case that you do you must look for the air leak and then when you see the air leak you decide whether you want to treat it on table by suturing it or whether you want to be conservative with it who who is this here please don't do this here what is this rubbish here i i can't deal with this 
can you see something on your screen or is it me who's seeing this on my screen everybody no, can, can see, see it sir can see it everybody can see it seems to be shubham yes. written as a shubham shubham yeah whatever it is yeah don't bubble don't test it, please bubble, bubble test, test. Uh, don't don't write on the screen because i i can't work otherwise okay one minute just wait i have to the problem of doing this as a meeting is that you unfortunately end up with uh, having to share your desktop so can you see my slide now yes yes sir okay thank you yes sir uh, yeah one minute wait now the problem is is one day so don't write on your screen guys <clears throat> it really distracts me and i forget what i was saying <clears throat> uh so intraoperative techniques are 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 uh, so where was I? i was talking about the bubble test yeah so good surgical technique is absolutely mandatory okay good surgical technique and then other uh, availability to you are pleural tenting diaphragmatic paralysis and pleurodesis and i'll talk about this in a minute just let's go through good surgical techniques first so gentle handling you must you must respect the lung you must respect all the other tissues around you so do not handle it roughly okay don't handle it like you're handling the bowel this the lung tears very easily and particularly in elderly patients so everything that you do should be gentle you should not tear the lung when you are pulling and pushing particularly when you are retracting very often i've seen uh, you know you put a ram please on the lung and then just pull and you get a big tear on the lung that's not good the other thing is you have to dissect along tissue planes that is absolutely mandatory okay uh try to follow the tissue planes a you will get less bleeding and b uh, there will be less tear on the parenchyma but of course in india and uh, you know rest of southeast asia uh, because of tuberculosis it is very difficult to find normal tissue plane so it is something that you just have to deal with when you go there uh, i personally like to use diathermy uh, i am a great fan of diathermy and if i have little Uh, holes on the surface of the lung i might even buzz it with diathermy that's supposed to be uh, local little holes can be dealt with with diathermy most other dissections uh, uh, you can use harmonic scalpel uh, it is definitely uh, less traumatic on the on the lung and uh, it allows you to work within the tissue planes if you see leaks on table then it's always a good idea to repair the leak okay absolutely important it's a good idea that you put in a couple of stitches on the table and try to stop the leak um always whenever you're doing uh, any uh, complex surgeries for inflammatory disease i have seen this happen that some people go in if they're draining an empyema for example they will just go into that loculated space drain the loculated space do a little bit of uh, dissection of the adhesions and then they find that uh, there is a huge amount of air leak because what happens is if you don't free the lung all around then the lung cannot re-expand and then that one area becomes a source of problem because the rest of the adhesions pull it down and it keeps that uh, tear on the lung open so always whenever you are operating on thoracic surgery as a philosophy i do it every single time i take down all adhesions absolutely whether i'm going to go to that area or not my post op recovery depends on how well my lung will re-expand and as a result of that i want to make sure that all adhesions are taken care and when i do a decortication i do a complete decortication i am not satisfied till i have got the hilum free anteriorly posteriorly superiorly and inferiorly which includes taking the entire lung off the surface of the diaphragm in tuberculosis that's a difficult area where the lung is stuck to the diaphragm and we do all of it by vats mind you so if we can do it by vats and we can open everything up there is no reason for open surgeons to not decorticate the lung completely because really our success in decortication i i uh, put it to only one factor and that is uh, complete decortication because that every single alveolus should be recruited so that the lung re expands though you may get a lot of air leak on the surface of the lung immediately as it re expands it touches the surface of the lung and within 24 to 48 hours you get pleural pleurodesis and air leak stops so you shouldn't worry about air leak in fact doing a complete decortication is a therapy for post operative air leak control okay 
and then when you're doing lobectomies, if there are no fissures and things like that, uh, I, I am quite happy to do a fissureless lobectomy, which means I don't open the fissure. I come at the hilum anteriorly and I work my way uh, from front to back or back to front, depending on whatever is the comfort zone. And I will take the structures first. And once I've taken the structures, artery vein and bronchus, that is when I lift up the lung and put a stapler across what would be the fissure. So I sometimes, many times, because of the adhesions and things, you cannot see the fissure. So now it's become almost a routine where you try to do a fissureless or a fissure last lobectomy. Okay, both the words are, are acceptable. Uh, fissureless means you just don't go into the uh, lobectomy, into the fissure. And fissure last means you staple the fissure at the end of the operation. So complete mobilization of the lung is absolutely mandatory to re-expand the lung and to make sure that it touches the chest wall. Okay, very, very important. On table, you have options of putting in a blood patch onto an area. If you think your stitches are not going to stick well, you just take the patient's own blood, put it there, and put a surgery cell on it, and it forms a patch on the surface of the lung. If you're going to do any of these techniques, then I suggest you do it with the lung expanded. Because when you expand the lung, uh, if you do it with the lung collapse, then when the lung expands, the patch just flows off because uh, you know the pressure on it uh, uh, just throws it, throws it off. So if you're going to do anything, uh, including sealants and stuff like that, you must re-expand the lung and put it at least on 80% expansion on the, of the lung, okay? Uh, you have uh, availability of something uh, of the pleural patch. You can locally dissect the pleura and put it on surface of the, of the lung and get a cover on it. Uh, you can create a pneumoperitoneum. This is especially when you've done a lower lobectomy and you're worried that the lung will not expand, then you can put in a varies needle into the abdomen and put in 500 ml air, and that will temporarily just lift the diaphragm up and uh, give you uh, approximation of the diaphragm to the base of the lung. And then uh, the air resolves by itself and gradually everything will then settle down uh, with time. At least the, the air leak stops because of pleurodesis. So that's another technique. Uh, some people have access to lasers and lasers are, are really good uh, for use on the lung because they are pneumostatic and, and it is a good idea to consider uh, lasers when you are doing metastatectomy, particularly when you are trying to excoriate out uh, multiple metastases. Uh, some of them, uh, you may not be able to staple everything, uh, particularly when it's a deep situated uh, metastasis. So then you use a laser to cut into the tissue and take out the metastases and then the laser, you buzz the raw surface and laser has a very good ability to be pneumostatic. It actually stops air leak on the surface of the lung. So we, I, I have used this many a times. I'm very happy with this technology. And uh, if you want someday, I'll show you uh, how lasers work. Uh, so this is how they talk about prediction of air leak. You've got to understand the philosophy of the air leak. This is from Gray's Anatomy. And, and whenever you, you, you're looking at it, you've got to look at high areas and low areas. And most of the places where you will get uh, high air leak are areas which are more aerated. So always look out for those areas. If you've got problems there, solve them, okay? It's very, very important to solve them. Sai Yendamuri has published a very nice uh, paper, actually. This, this video is from Sai's paper. Uh, he talks about apical tenting. So if um, the lung cannot go to the chest wall, then get the chest wall to come down to the lung. And you don't want to do a thoracoplasty. So on table, what you do, even by VADS, is just make an incision on the pleura and dissect extra pleurally. And the moment you dissect extra pleurally, this pleura will come down. It's called as pleural tenting, and it will cover the staple line. The important thing is to cover the staple line and the obvious areas of uh, of uh, uh, air leak because you do the uh, air test and you see and then if you want to use natural tissue within the chest use the pleura it's a beautiful tool so you dissect extra pleurally bring the whole pleura down and that actually helps to stop the air leak okay uh, this is the technique of doing an extra pleural or a fissureless lobectomy uh, sorry not extra pleural fissure last or a fissureless uh, pneumonectomy where you go at the back of the hilum or the front of the hilum so if you're going in a right upper lobectomy at the back of the hilum, you start with the bronchus and then you go structure by structure as you get in and you make tunnels outside the lung. So you're not touching the lung at all. 
all the dissection happens in this area. So the artery, vein, bronchus, everything gets taken in this area. And then once the whole upper lobe is devascularized and cut away from the main structures, you then just put your stapler across like this and create the fissure with the staple line. So this is a very nice te to, technique to learn. And I would recommend all people who are doing lobectomies, you must uh, learn to do this sort of lobectomy. It's a good technique and gives you good control of the vessels. Uh, on table, you do have the option of using surgical sealants. There are a lot of sealants in the market. And I'll just enumerate the few that, uh, that are commonly used, okay? So fibrin glue is available and you can use that as a, as a tool for spraying the area. There is something called as autologous fibrin sealant, which is a vivo stack. Each one of this is just made up of a different uh, ke chemical composition. So I'm just going to talk about the composition that it is, but you know, you must know the trade name. So vivo stat is a fibrin sealant. Uh, taco seal is a nice patch. It, it, it works like a plural patch. So it is available like a flat, uh, you know, like a surgery cell. And then uh, it's a flat uh, sheet. And then you take it and wherever you've got air leak, instead of putting sutures through the surface of the uh, surface of the lung, you patch it. You just stick the taco seal onto it. And, and surprise, surprise, it actually works very well on the surface of the lung to stop air leaks. In fact, it's a very good tool even for uh, stopping bleeding. So a lot of people use it. Uh, the Japanese particularly use a lot of taco seal for, uh, for thoracic surgery. Uh, there is something called as a proactivated synthetic sealant. Uh, this is an adverse seal. Again, I'm not going to go into details of each one of these. Uh, this is not the talk today, but it's important to know these things. And then Progel, and Progel is the only US FDA approved for air leak, okay? So let me tell you about the other ones, the bovine serum glutenhaldehyde, which is a bio glue, uh, fibrinogen thrombin tisil, which we use quite regularly, uh, a polymeric hydrogel called as co-seal. Co-seal is used, has two functions. One, it is uh, pneumostatic, and more importantly, co-seal can actually also uh, prevent adhesions forming uh, wherever it is sprayed. So you, you might actually, uh, it works very well in pediatric surgeries uh, where you know you're going to do multiple surgeries in future. So you don't want the heart to stick to the back of the sternum. Uh, and similarly in adult cardiac as well, you can use Coseal, particularly when you're doing aortic surgery or you're doing elephant trunk in two stages. So you don't want adhesion. So Coseal is used. But Coseal is also used as a, lung sealant and there is a recommendation and there are some studies which have looked at it and it's a decent uh, enough product. But the one that is uh, used across the US is Progel. Most of the people in the US actually use this because it's biodegradable, which means that with time, it will just degrade and go away and will not stay there for the rest of your life. So these are all the sealants that are available to you. I'll just quickly show you the previous one. So Vivostat, Taco Seal, Adverseal, Bioglue, Tisil, Coseal, Progel, uh, and that's the ones. Uh, the issue with sealants are there are costs involved with the sealants, but whenever you are going to look at cost, don't look at just the cost of the sealant. Look at the cost of having a patient stay in hospital for five, seven, 10 extra days uh, versus opening one sealant on table. So that is the balance you have to make when you make this decision. So always make sure that you are not uh, you know, trying to being penny wise and pound foolish. So very often I've seen surgeons do that. They don't open the correct uh, device on table and then have some problems afterwards and end up spending three times more in the post-operative period. So cost is always a relative topic. You must balance things out before you decide uh, use or not use of a product on cost alone. Of course, you have to look at the ceiling property of the product. Uh, you have to look at the specific use, which are the ones which are actually uh, licensed for use as a, as a, as a pneumostat. Uh, and, and, and the important thing with sealants, whenever you're going to use sealants, just like I told you with the blood patch, I've seen this many times, young surgeons uh, saying, oh, open the co-seal, open the co-seal. And then they, they don't expand the lung. They, they, they just go in there and spray the co-seal on a collapsed lung. And then do the do the uh, underwater test and find that there is no air leak and they are very happy. And then they come out and leave a drain and come out and next morning there is bubbling 
on the chest drain and they wonder they say coseal is rubbish uh, you it's, it's a rubbish product etc etc the reality is that the moment you expand the lung whatever is stuck on the surface of the lung because the lung expands uh, it just flies away so it is you have just wasted 15000 rupees for nothing if you have applied it on a collapsed lung so the trick to apply any sealant on the surface of the lung is to always have the lung expanded at least 80% that's enough to give you a view even if you're doing it by vats it doesn't matter 80% expansion of the lung is enough to give you a view you don't want to really blow it into your face but make sure it is spread on an expanded lung so there's less chance of the sealant flying away when the lung expands okay it's like a balloon so you got to have the balloon up if you put it on a collapsed balloon and then blow the balloon up it's obviously it's going to fly away so that's something that you got to remember this is how fibrin sealants work this is the pathway they follow and then sealants work in this fibrinogen uh, fibrin monomer and they form a clot which sits on the which sits on the area and stops the air leak okay uh, when you are operating there are many ways you can deliver these uh, sealants uh, there are two main methods one is a drip method and one is a spray method the drip method works very well when you are doing a small uh, localized area but when you've got a broad area to cover then spray method works very well because spray gives you a larger cubic uh, meter coverage as opposed to a drip method uh, uh sometimes some of the sealants need to be re uh, so they they are stored at a certain temperature so you might have to heat them up to activate them particularly to seal needs to be heated up to be activated to become a good agent uh i whenever because i do everything by vats i use the diplo spray mis uh, device uh this is a very nice device because it allows you to spray evenly with the pressure so uh, the pressure allows you to uh reach all areas of the lung with a single vial whereas if you do dripping it will all get localized to one area and that might not be adequate this is available either as this uh, tip uh which is just a direct application tip or you have this minimally invasive uh, long tip and this is the one that i use i prefer the minimally invasive long tip it is always got two solutions within it and then this uh, this pressure device gets attached with a lure lock to the tip and as you inject that pressure disperses the tip over a large area okay uh, coseal is a synthetic sealant the good advantage of coseal is you can immediately open and use it as opposed to uh tisil because tisil you have to reconstitute which takes about 8 to 10 minutes uh tisil is a sealant uh so it is uh, actually used for uh, covering surfaces of lung uh, to prevent uh, air leak so it's a pneumostat but one addi addition uh, property of tisil is it is a, it has got anti adhesive properties and that for me is a problem because many a times i am actually banking on adhesions and fluorodesis for my air leak to stop so that is what stops me from using coseal because if i have sprayed coseal over a large area then if there is some leak left behind that area may not stick to the chest wall and so that is actually counterproductive for me uh, in in choosing a sealant so it it is uh, it's sort of a, it's a catch 22 uh, situation Uh, you must always check the leak under water dry the area should not apply any sealant on a wet area you have to dry the area you have to reinflate to 70 to 80% and spray from a distance don't go too close this is not just for coastal this is for everything the moment you spray from a distance from 1 ml you can get 25 square centimeter coverage which is quite a large area to get coverage for okay so there's a lot of data out there prospective randomized studies uh, you know various uh, quite a lot of level uh, 1b 1c 2a data which is talking about use of sealants in thoracic surgery uh, and uh, you can take it or leave it depending on what is your local uh, strategies i personally inject the phrenic with marcaine uh i i am very keen on that uh i i whenever i do a lobectomy particularly for a tuberculous patient i just take uh, marcin and it gives you enough uh, paralysis for uh, you know 8 to 20 24 hours for the lung for the diaphragm to come up and allow the lung to stick to the chest wall so i am quite happy with marcin uh, phrenic crush can be done 
but should be avoided because really it takes a long time for the uh, lung to for the phrenic to regenerate but uh, it can work in some uh, tuberculous situations aspergillosis situations i do use phrenic crush uh, sometimes i don't cut it i just lightly crush it just enough to allow uh, neuropraxia and to allow the diaphragm to come up uh, and uh, every time that you operate on an inflammatory disease uh, or on a patient with uh, chemo radiotherapy previous chemo radiotherapy i will always cover my stump that is my mandatory rule whether i'm doing tuberculous uh, uh, you know lobectomies or, or if i'm doing uh, uh, downstage lung cancer i don't like to leave the stump behind you know for extra 20 25 minutes uh, you will save the patient a uh, 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 prolonged air leak with the the stump giving way so i am very very cautious about it i use intercostal muscle because i do it by vats uh, or robotics uh, and i can just swing the intercostal muscle down the important thing when you harvest the intercostal muscle is that you got to remember to keep the vascularity intact a dead muscle is no good okay so you you need to when you harvest be very careful not to damage the intercostal artery Uh, and um, you know make sure that you you cut and tie because the artery comes from the back to the front so always cut and tie the front end so that maximum pressure flow comes in into the intercostal artery uh, if you are doing it going to do it by open thoracotomy uh, then you do have an option of serratus uh, to be used as a as a uh, as a muscle flap a lot of people who do uh, sleeve resections uh, i know sai for one uh, whenever he does a sleeve resection by open technique he will actually harvest the serratus first as soon as he starts the operation uh, before going into the chest he will actually along the way of the incision he will harvest the serratus and uh, cover it with uh, some uh, vasodilator solution and then go in and do his operation and then get the serratus down through an intercostal space higher he doesn't use the same space he goes one space higher and then puts it around the uh, sleeve resection that he has done so it's it's a good technique to prevent air leak uh, and and to get stability of the area but i cannot stress important that um, the one most important factor of post operative problems is an incorrectly placed chest tube uh, you will be surprised the number of times where the tube gets pulled back or uh, the hole comes into the chest wall because you've forgotten to tie it properly or or, or uh, because the the you you didn't place it all the way to the apex so you're not draining the apex completely uh, so really the number of times patients get surgical emphysema because the tube is not correctly placed is a real disaster for the patient in a standard scenario i use a 28 french uh, drain uh, when i'm uh, whenever i'm doing empyema surgery or whenever i am doing hemothorax surgery i will use a 32 french uh, drain as standard uh, the drain must reach the apex because air go, rises to the top so you must make sure that the drain doesn't get uh, you know stuck in the bottom or doesn't get stuck between the fissures very often you have seen people put a drain and it's going lying between the fissures on the way to the top so it's not good it must be extra plural uh, and it extra plural meaning within the plural space but extra lung extra the visceral plural not within the fissures of the lung um, you must remember that any drain that you put in no matter how well you tie it when the patient is turned from a lateral thoracotomy position to a supine position there is a pull on the skin and the fat and all drains shorten by 2 cm as a rule they shorten by 2 cm so whenever i am doing vats lobectomy or something uh, my juniors will tell you i will always oversize the drain which means the tip of my drain doesn't reach the apex it reaches beyond the apex and curls down by about 2 cm so that when the patient gets turned over and then you take an x ray post surgery you will see that the aim drain will lie exactly on the apex so it is important to make sure that your drain is correctly placed and to understand that all drains shorten by 2 cm very very important now i use only a single drain in my clinical practice hence i make an extra hole at the base for the fluid to come out okay uh, if you are not comfortable with that you can use two drains i don't have a problem 
but make sure whatever you do, you must drain the pleural cavity completely. And if you make an extra hole at the base, make sure it's not too low. Otherwise that will get shortened and it will lie in the subcutaneous tissue. And all the air leak from the chest will go into the subcutaneous tissue and you will end up with a pneumo surgical emphysema. So very, 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 very important. You may use two drains. I don't have a problem. Whatever is your technique, make sure that the drain is fixed well to the chest wall because losing a drain post-surgery because the patient pulled it is a disaster because putting a drain back in the ward, A, is not good for the patient's confidence and more importantly, you will introduce sepsis into a post-lobectomy space and that is a disaster. So a small thing like tying the drain properly is absolutely mandatory when you're talking about air leak control. Very, very, very important. It's a very small point, but it's exceedingly important. Okay, so post-operative strategies. Now, I don't like peep on my lungs whenever I have operated. I, I try not to give them uh, you know, any positive pressure ventilation. And so I will always extubate on table. I actually stand in the theater many, many a times with my anesthetist and I will say, uh, even if you feel that he's going to be re don't worry, but please extubate on table. Try and extubate on table. And 99% of the times you get away with it. And so I'm very, very keen. I always connect my drains to suction. There are two philosophies, one off suction and one uh, no suction. So I'll talk about that in one minute. But personally, I've always worked with suction and I'm quite happy with that. I also do a chest X-ray and recovery. Uh, again, I've seen papers, uh, particularly in the UK and in the NHS where they have said, oh, there is no need for doing a chest X-ray and recovery. But I feel that at least when I've done a chest X-ray, I know what is happening in the chest. I can see where my drain is positioned. I can see if there is any collection or anything stupid that's happening in there or the drain is kinked and the patient is getting a pneumothorax. Stuff like that can be picked up. So I like to get a chest X-ray in recovery. And that's my rule. I, I don't um, hesitate on that. Uh, portable suction drain, I use digital suction drainage. A uh, Topaz is, is an excellent tool. In my, uh, you know, I have worked in India over 10 years with the tuberculosis patients. And the only thing that I feel added value to my surgery uh, of VADS decortication with fibrotic TB lungs is the use of digital suction device. Because digital suction device gives you sustained suction, assured suction, because wall suction cannot be assured. It can go up and down depending upon what is the pressure in that area. But more importantly, it allows the lung to come up to the chest wall. And I strongly believe, and there is enough evidence now to show that most air leaks stop because of pleurodesis, not because of what you're doing, uh, you know, sealants and all that. When the lung comes and touches the chest wall and it sticks to the chest wall, that is when air leaks stop. So this philosophy is very important. And that is why I personally use the suction quite a lot and I'm quite happy with that. The other important thing is early mobilization. Mandatory, you must get the patient out of, out of bed within four to six hours of the operation. He must sit upright. He must start doing his physiotherapy, his his uh, incentive spirometry, uh, whatever you want, you must push the patient. I'll talk about incentive spirometry in a minute. There is a paper which says it is actually not good. There is no benefit with incentive spirometry, and I'll tell you about that. Uh, suction or not to suction? Suction is a double-edged sword, okay? It, it is uh, it's something you've got to remember. I think in the first 48 hours, it's very good. It allows the lung to re-expand, pulls up the lung to the chest wall, but you also got to remember that after two to three days of surgery, it also sucks on that area which is causing the air leak and it helps to keep the air leak patent. So it's very important to judiciously use the suction for 48 hours to 72 hours, but you must know when to turn off the suction and then get the patient to re-expand on its own. Because sometimes if the air leak is kept patent and the patient is continuously bubbling, taking him off suction will allow the lung to collapse a little bit. And when it collapses a little bit, A will touch B, which means the two edges of that air leak will touch each other and then they will heal with fibrosis and then the lung will re-expand. So this is a philosophy that you have to understand. It's a physiology of the lung. 
So just by using suction, keeping the two edges of the tear apart will not help it to heal. So sometimes you have to let go of the suction, let the lung collapse a little bit. Don't worry about the chest X-ray if there's a 20% collapse because the collapse will pucker the lung and will pucker the two edges of that leak together and it will heal and then the lung will re-expand. So different surgeons have different protocols. I personally use two KPAs and I'm extremely happy with that. And uh, within three days, if I have a problem, I think the air leak is not healing. Uh, there are two things you have to understand. One is, is it a major air leak, which means it's coming from a bronchus? Then I will go back into theater because it is torrential air leak. I know it will never heal no matter what I do. But if it is just a subtle air leak, you know, 200, 300, 400 on the, on the topaz device, I'm not worried. I'm rest assured that that will heal with time. Uh, but you have to be sensible enough and experienced enough to realize that the air leak is coming from the alveolar air leak and not from a bronchus. So if it's a bronchial air leak within 48 hours, you just go back to theater and close it again. Uh, so it's important to understand the difference between the two. So there is a lot of data out there. There's a meta-analysis uh, where they've said that suction is uh, does not add value to, to this uh, surgery. So routine use of suction is actually not recommended according to this meta-analysis. But then they also say that early use of suction might be crucial to specific patients uh, where a residual space is, uh, is, is important. So there are many ways you can interpret. There are many other meta-analysis as well. Some for suction, some against suction. I think we have not answered this question as yet. So the important thing is the suction has to be right. If you are getting a wrong suction, which means that uh, your suction is not on, then you are creating a completely blocked uh, tube. If you know what I mean. I mean, if it is without suction, at least it's open to air and any collection in the chest will drain out through an open, open channel at the other end. But if you've connected a suction tubing to that uh, end and the suction is not working, then you have created a closed tubing and the whole system becomes closed. And then you will end up with a surgical emphysema or tension pneumothorax. So if you are going to use suction, it has to be correct suction. You cannot have a blocked suction. Uh, in that situation, it's better not to use a suction. But because of that, I, uh, because I use a digital suction device, I know my suction cannot go wrong. The device works. And if the device is malfunctioning, and then I'll take out the device and keep it without suction. That's okay with me. Uh, incentive spirometry is used uh, quite aggressively in India and uh, other countries. I've seen this. It allows patients to do physiotherapy exercises and allows them to uh, cough up all the phlegm and things like that. But there's a very nice paper which has actually looked, uh, and this is a really nice, uh, well-written, well-done study, well-written study, which actually has looked at the effectiveness of incentive spirometry. And to be honest, in England, uh, they don't use incentive spirometry as a routine uh, until and unless there are specific indications uh, where you want to uh, encourage the patient and things like that. But routine use of uh, post-operative incentive spirometry is almost given up in the UK, but still continues in England and in other in India and in other parts of the world. So the the, the we still don't know what is the answer to that. I mean, this is uh, Rajesh Pala and Maninder Kalkata are one of the authors. So it's a very well done study. And uh, in the UK, they don't really use incentive spirometry. Uh, I published this paper uh, uh, with an integration of robotic uh, VATS uh, and Ayurveda and yoga. And, and this paper has been extremely well received around the world. Uh, I get invites uh, all over the world to, to really go and lecture on the benefits of integrative medicine. And what I do is I, because I worked in India, we have access to a yoga therapist and we have access to an integration, integrative medicine uh, physician. So all three of us are part of the team and my patients are taught pre-operatively all these exercises, these deep breathing exercises. Now I'm not a yoga expert, but I can tell you that my patients love it. In India particularly, they love it. So you teach them pre-operatively and within four hours following the surgery, this guy will come back into the ICU or in the uh, high, high HDU or in the ward and he will start mobilizing the patients. And because these guys have learned these techniques, uh, they start to uh, you know, do them very quickly. 
And we looked at our data and we analyzed the data. And in the paper we published, we found that the amount of drainage uh, with use of yoga actually goes down. Uh, intercostal, uh, the lung expansion increases uh, significantly. And the uh, drain dwell time, that is the amount of time that the drain stays postoperatively has significantly gone down. I'm not saying yoga alone adds to that. It's, it's a combination of everything. All the things that I told you before, plus uh, physiotherapy, plus yoga. It's, it's a lethal mix which allows the patient to get out of bed quickly and the lung re-expands. And the moment the lung re-expands, it touches the chest wall, the air leak usually stops. And that's been our experience with uh, these things. So. We've spoken about air leaks. We've spoken about what are the pre-intraoperative strategies. We've spoken about post-operative uh, strategies. Now let's have a look at prolonged air leak and try to understand what do we do when we are dealing with somebody who's got air leak for more than five uh, for more than five days. So this is what I told you. This is the definition of prolonged air leak. Anything more than five days. Uh, or a large amount of fluid coming over after five days is, is an air leak and should be, uh, it's worrisome. There are a lot of factors which can, which give you, which are risk factors for uh, prolonged air leak. Uh, predominant among them are lung conditions, uh, age, uh, advanced age, uh, presence of uh, previous radiotherapy, malnutrition. And each of this is actually from the guidelines and from the uh, databases, okay? Uh, dense adhesions, redo surgery, steroid dependent, hypoproteinemia, incomplete fissures, a history of smoking, poor FEV1, <coughs> residual cancer at resection margins predisposes to uh, breakdowns, and the use of postoperative uh, PEEP or positive pressure ventilation. All of these have, uh, each one of this is a separate paper, and they've all been proven to be risk factors for prolonged air leak. And when any of these risk factors are present, intraoperatively, I become two or three times more cautious when I'm operating on these patients. I make sure that on table, I take all strategies to at least reduce the surgical air leak that I can, that I can physically see. I will make sure that I do everything. So I really push hard for this group of patients to make sure that we don't end up with a prolonged air leak in the post-operative period. Now, there's a little bit of discussion of two drains versus one drain. Uh, uh, actually, all papers, at least the current papers, have shown that there is no benefit of two drains. Putting in two, one apical, one basal was a standard practice, which I trained in, and, and uh, also using uh, a figure of less than 100 ml as a cutoff point for taking out the drain. All of that has finished now. It's, it's gone. It's, it's in history. All papers that have looked at the outcomes, and uh, these are good quality papers, have all said that there is no benefit of putting two drains over a single drain. Uh, single drain shortens length of hospital stay. It shortens pain. Uh, of course, if there is inadequate drainage or if in the post-operative period you find that your drain is not doing well or the patient's developing a surgical emphysema, go ahead and put in a second drain. There's, that's not the problem. But to put in two, dra two drains in all patients, no matter whether you're doing a pleurectomy, bullectomy surgery, or uh, you know small metaphysics, is actually frowned upon nowadays. Nobody does that. Almost everybody has given up the use of two drains. Most of us use a single drain and extra long drain. But the old timers don't like it. Uh, of course, you've got surgical emphysema, you put in a second drain. Uh, so there are a lot of trials. Look at the number of trials. All of them have looked the first eight or 10 of them, uh, sorry, this is the other paper. Uh, this is the paper of digital versus standard wall suction. That's the other new topic, the hot topic in the exam that gets discussed. And if you look at this collection of papers, almost all of them, the recent ones with decent uh, number of patients are actually favoring digital suction over standard wall suction. There are a lot of problems with the wall suction because uh, uh, it's not standard available. Sometimes the device malfunctions, the pressure in the system doesn't work. And more importantly, the patient gets stuck to the bed and he can't go to the toilet. With digital suction, you just disconnect the, the lead, uh, the power lead, and it has got a battery and he can walk around and he can 
moved. So we strongly suggest use of digital suction device. There are two types available. One is the Atmos and the other one is Topaz. It doesn't matter which one you use, but in the current scenarios, digital suction device is an excellent tool. It gives you a graphic recording of what happened over 24 hours. You can also look at what happened over the last seven days, six days, whatever time the patient is in theater. And also you can download all this to your computer. So it becomes a very good database for a paper uh, that you want to write in future. So if you look at the first uh, five, six, seven, eight, all of them have favored uh, digital suction. The ones at the bottom here were the earlier papers and they did not find much difference between the two. So they didn't say that digital suction was bad or worse than uh, standard. They said it's just as good. But now the current papers that are coming through, almost all of them are talking about digital suction. So take a snapshot of this screen and you can actually use this in the exam to, to uh, talk about why you should use it. So two are available, uh, Atmos, not Atrium, Atmos. I'm sorry about that spelling mistake. It's Atmos and Topaz. Those are the two that are available, okay? All right, so what are your management strategies? Uh, is, it, is it going okay? Is everybody happy so far? Or am I going too fast? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's okay, isn't it? Because yes. this is more clinical, I don't have to explain a lot of things, so I'm very happy yes, to sir. just move along, okay, at the space that we're doing. So for persistent air leak, uh, there are various management strategies. Uh, one is the medical or the conservative management strategy. Uh, which would include watchful waiting, uh, suction, physiotherapy. Again, some people don't like suction, so we don't have an answer to that. Uh, sometimes in patients who are not uh, suitable for any surgical reintervention, you might actually consider bedside fluorodesis and, and just get away with it. Uh, but most of the patients, because you've operated and it's a post-operative patient, you actually want to do something surgically if the air leak has become prolonged. And surgically, if you have to do, you have endobronchial therapy available to you, and you have the possibility of surgical exploration and going in and sorting out the air leak wherever it is happening. So these are all the gamut of uh, things that are available. If you do, do have to do uh, bedside fluorodesis, uh, then uh, talc is a good agent. Uh, I personally use uh, talc a lot. Uh, it's available in India. Uh, I told in yesterday's lecture as well, uh, a group called as Rohit Surgicals has the uh, has the thing, I think, and they provide you with talc. Talc is available uh, as a powder solution and also as a pressurized solution. So you can make a talc slurry with 50 ml of saline, uh, one bottle or two bottles of talc and 20 ml of uh, lignocaine and then push it into the drain. But you must not clamp the drain because the patient has got air leak. So you have to add extra long tubings to hang the tubing above the patient's bed so that you use an IV drip and hang it from there so that the talc doesn't pour out. And that uh, you leave it there for an hour or two as long as the patient can tolerate it. And then uh, you achieve medical pleurodesis in these patients. Uh, the other agents which I have used is tetracycline. Uh, but the, it's tetracycline now is banned. It's uh, almost not available in any market. Uh, luckily, we've had some stock lying around which we've used in the past. Uh, but nowadays, it's it's almost difficult to get tetracycline. You have bleomycin as well, which can be used as a local pleurodesing agent to achieve uh, pleurodesis. Uh, you must remember that when you're pushing something into a post-operative chest, uh, there is always a risk of infection. So whenever we do these procedures, we do them almost with surgical uh, precision and surgical disinfection. We make sure that everything that you use, you do it like a proper surgical procedure, uh, even if you're doing in a side room of, of a ward, uh, just make sure that you do not introduce infection into the chest. That would be a disaster. Uh, some people have used blood. Uh, it was quite popular earlier. Uh, still, I know of some surgeons who use about 50 ml of patient's own blood, autologous blood. But again, the worry is uh, risk of infection. But blood is an excellent tool for causing pleurodesis. In fact, uh, that is one of the reasons why we do pleural abrasion following some surgery because you want to generate a bit of blood and ooze on the surface of the pleura and don't wash it out completely. Let the lung come up to the, uh, to the chest wall and the moment the blood is there, it causes the uh, pleurodesis and sticks the lung 
to the chest wall. So excellent tool actually for uh, causing fluid disease. But if you look at literature across the board for post-operative or post-surgical medical fluoresis, uh, fluoridesis, there is a wide variety of outcomes. And some papers have said that with bleomycin, they had 85% failure rate. So really, there's a wide variety from 27% to 87%. I have read extensively on this subject. And I, I promise you, there's, every paper has got a different rate. There is no uh, standard guideline which tells you uh, what is the right thing to use. But now, almost everybody uses talc. And it's not your normal talcum powder, it's surgical talc. Because it has to be of a certain diameter. The molecule of the talc has to be of a certain diameter so that it does not enter into the circulation and does not uh, into the capillary circulation and does not cause systemic um, allergic reactions and things like that. So if you're going to use talc, please use surgical talc. That's the one that you have to use, okay? All right. Uh, Heimlich valve is a much touted uh, technique for uh, post-operative uh, prolonged air leak, and I'll tell you about it. Uh, in India, in the UK, I use Heimlich valve, easily available, not expensive in India. I use a urine bag with a non-return valve. Uh, I just, I'll show you that in a minute. And I just cut off the tip and connect it to the bag. And it's a beautiful tool, works very well, gets the patient mobile very fast, okay? Then you have certain devices which you can connect and the patient can take home. So there is something called as a pneumostat device uh, from Atrium. Uh, and there is a portable topaz, a small size topaz which they are making. So you send the patient home with these things. The idea of putting these valves is that you quickly mobilize the patient and send them home. So I'll tell you what my practice is in a minute. So this is what how an Heimlich valve is attached. It's got a one-way valve in it. So the air coming out from there can come out, but no air can go back. It's a one-way valve. So it doesn't allow air to go back or fluid to go back, but air and fluid from the chest can come out into a bag or a bottle or whatever you want to use. Uh, this is what I use. Uh, if you look carefully, I've taken a snapshot of the center of the bag. It's got a one-way valve. It's a non-return flutter valve. And so every time you connect it to the patient's, chair, uh, patient's chest tube, the air will come out and collect into this area, but it cannot go back because of this non-return valve. The one important thing you must remember is that you must cut off this blue thing. Okay, it's absolutely, my, the number of times I've seen people make this mistake is that they don't cut off this blue thing and send the patient home and the patient collects fluid into this. And when he goes to sleep, some of it falls off. So he thinks, oh, there is a leak and he seals this, he closes this cap. The moment you close the cap, you have created a closed system. If you create a closed system, rest assured he's gonna get tension pneumothorax because there is no way the air can come out. So you must, 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 when you connect this bag, you must cut off this cap so that the patient has no way to close this seal off. So that any fluid that collects, he just has to keep it straight so that it doesn't fall off. And every morning he just measures it, writes it into his diary and then throws the fluid away. So the whole idea is to throw the fluid away, not to keep it in the bag. I've seen people very uh, proudly carrying 800 ml in it. That's not the point. The point is you have to throw the fluid in the sink every day. But the real reason why you use this is to allow the air to come out, okay? So this is a very good tool as a flutter valve in, in patients. Um, so this is my strategy. Now look at how I deal with this. Whenever on the ward round, I've got a guy, a post-operative patient, I'll put him on suction. I use Topaz. Within two to three days, if the air leak is not stopping, uh, I, I am worried that it will not stop. I think it's significant. Then I will convert him to a flutter valve or a urine bag with a valve. Uh, the other thing that I also do with this patient is I will put in a little uh, bandage, a long roller bandage, and tie this back across his shoulder so that it becomes like a, like a purse. So he can carry it on, a, on his purse below his shirt, and then he can wear his shirt on top of it. So I will very quickly to connect him to flutter bag. I'll keep him in the hospital for 24 hours to make sure that he's tolerating the flutter bag. It's not too much fluid or uh, he's not getting tension or anything like that. And then I will discharge him. Very quickly I discharge him. So within three, four, five days, he's out of my ward, okay? Then I call him back into the outpatient the next week, okay? I give him five, six days for the thing to settle. I look at him clinically and I want to see that 
flutter valve and I ask him to cough. If he coughs and I see a flutter in the valve, a large flutter in the valve, then I will say, okay, it's still leaking. And I will send him back and call him back. If I feel that the flutter is not there or the flutter is there, but a small amount because of the medial spinal movement, then I am very happy to clamp the drain. So in the morning, when he comes to my clinic, he will have a chest X-ray. Then I will see him. I want to make sure on the chest X-ray that the lung seems to be expanded. Clinically, I want to make sure that there is no flutter on that flutter valve. And then next morning, what I'll do, uh, so the same day, uh, once I have seen that, I'll clamp the drain. But the important thing is if you have clamped the drain, you must not allow him to go somewhere else to have coffee, tea, lunch, or whatever. He must stay in your clinical area for two hours. Because if he goes somewhere else and he starts to develop a tension pneumothorax, that's a disaster because you've really clamped the drain and you've made the body like there is no drain. So if he starts to have a tension pneumothorax, he will collapse and die somewhere in the coffee shop downstairs. So he is not allowed to go out of my clinical area. Uh, you know, the nurse is there and somebody is always keeping an eye out for him or a relative is there. After two hours, he goes down to radiology and he has a repeat chest X-ray. Once I've seen the repeat chest X-ray, if it is same as it was before clamping, then I know that the patient will tolerate the drain coming out and I take the drain out. I just pull it out and I always leave a first string there, which I tie off. Of course, if I find that the chest X-ray is showing a slightly increased pneumothorax, then I'll release the clamp. And nothing lost by it. The patient feels comfortable uh, and, and you just send him home. And he comes back two, three days later or next week. And usually, I mean, 99% of the times, I have found by the next week, everything is stopped and you just take the brain out. And, and this way you reduce his hospital stay uh, and he, he gets to go home. That is the most important thing. Of course, if he's from outstation, then my hospital has got a lot of uh, hotels around there, which are a lot cheaper than staying in hospital. So we send them to the hotel. But of course, he's got instruction that if he has any shortness of breath or any problem, he must come back to the A&E immediately. Uh, if for three weeks, I find that there is no resolution, that's my uh, threshold, actually. Three weeks, uh, if I find that nothing is happening, uh, it's not improving, the guy is still bubbling, things are not going well, it's not reducing in size, then I will think about going back in and trying to do something. And most of the time we go back in by VATS. We don't actually convert anything that is VATS into a trichotomy. Uh, to be honest, over the years, I've never had to convert a VATS into a trichotomy to solve air leak problems. I just go in by the same incision and we have a look and... Uh, Whatever is the problem, we will either stitch it or we'll put a sealant on it or a patch on it and uh, we'll come out. Uh, sometimes I have seen patients, one or two patients, uh, it, it's not been often that I had to go back in. Over the years, I probably think uh, maybe one every two years that I have to go back in for air leak. Uh, and uh, sometimes I see them at 21 days, but I find that the air leak is nicely tapering down. It has gone down. The patient is tolerating well, then I'm happy to wait even longer than that. It's only when the air leak is persistent and the lung is down and not coming up, that is when I go back into the chest and solve the problem. Uh, so, um, of course, post-operatively, if on the ward round, I found that the guy's got a massive air leak, which is not in keeping with the operation that I've done. I mean, if I've done an LVRS, that's a different thing. If I've done a massive decortication, but if I've done a straightforward lobectomy and then I find there's a massive air leak or there is a grade three air leak and there is no resolution of that air leak. In fact, uh, the next day the air leak has gone up, then I am thinking that my staple line has given way. Okay, and this has happened maybe two or three times uh, over my career. And, and I, I really trust my staples quite a lot. I trust that uh, the quality of staples that I'm using are really good. Uh, hence, um, you know, to go back in for a suspected bronchopleural dehiscence is not very common in my practice. So I will actually take the patient to bronchoscopy. I want to have a look. And then if I feel that the staple line is given way or something is not right, I will re-explore. And then most of the times when I re-explore, what I do is I don't stape, I don't suture that area. I actually lift it up and try to put a line of staples proximal to it. 
So usually uh, that area after three days, two days has become a little shabby and I'm worried that my stitch may not stay on there. So usually I'll try and lift it up and put a staple proximal to it. Of course, sometimes you can't do it because you're worried you'll compromise the proximal bronchus. Then I will staple, uh, suture it. And in those situations, if I have sutured it and I'm worried about that area, I will put in a muscle clap on top of it just to get uh, further assurance. All of this is not proven by, by any studies or anything like that. Most of the times you put in a muscle flap because you feel safe. There is really no evidence which says that the muscle flap is making the air leak stop. Uh, so that's, that's the strategy for acute and non-acute uh, problems. Uh, so the next uh, situation is delayed uh, bronchopleural fistula, proper bronchopleural fistula. Uh, for me, whenever I'm dealing with a bronchopleural fistula, which we all do in our careers, uh, my philosophy is control the infection. Most important, do not rush into theater. Do not rush into theater. Control the infection. Once you've got infection under control, that is the time to operate. You must drain the infected space. So I will always put in a chest drain into the pleural space. Allow the pus to come out. Give him systemic antibodies, uh, antibiotics, give him nutrition, build up the patient. Uh, then I will decide. Uh, so I don't treat immediately. I'll give him at least a week, 10 days to settle down. Let the sepsis go away. Let the nutrition go up. Then if it's a small fistula, then I might do it via bronchoscopy. And if it's a large fistula, I will do a surgical management of the fistula. And I'll discuss about all of this in more details. So what are the endoscopic techniques available to you for, uh, for uh, bronchopleural fistulas? The endoscopic valves, which I spoke about, I think a couple of days ago when I did the endobronchial surgery, they are actually licensed for use uh, for air leaks. Uh, so what we do is we uh, go in with the, uh, with the uh, chartist system and we try to find out selectively which is the area which is leaking air. And then we insert an endobronchial valve into that area and uh, allow the lung to collapse distal to it. So this is what we do. Uh, these are the valves that we use, but this is what we do. We go in with the, with the catheter, the balloon catheter, and we block each segment sequentially. So we look for the upper lobe, the you know, apical, posterior. So we go segmental anatomy and block it. We inflate the balloon and block that. And we look at the chest drain and we wait for five uh, mechanical breaths. And if in that five mechanical breaths, the air leak has stopped with inflation of the balloon, we know that that is the area that is a problem. So moment you know that is that area is a problem, you deploy a stent. So what the stent will do is, uh, not a stent, you deploy a valve, an endobronchial valve. And what the valve will do is it will block off that area and allow the airway behind it to collapse. The collapse will allow the two edges of your air leak to come together and that will heal. And then once the, you've got rid of the drain after uh, a week or so, you, 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 um, you make sure that the patient is stable, x-ray is fine. Then you take out the drain and then six weeks down the road, you go back in and you pull the valve out. You don't leave it in there because you don't want the valve to go and uh, get obliterated on the normal side. So you actually physically pull the valve out. So this is how the valve looks. And all you have to do is you have to catch this with a grasping forceps and tug on it and the whole valve comes out. But that is done about six weeks down the road, okay? So it's quite important to understand. Uh, there is a very nice uh, paper uh, published in JTD which talks about bronchoscopic management of prolonged air leak. Uh, I'll just move this out of the way. Uh, sorry, hang on. Okay, so this is in JTD. Uh, take a screenshot of this and uh, it talks about all the various techniques to do while you are placing the valve and how to make sure that the valve is actually closing the air leak. So it's a very nice document, which will tell you, these are the papers that talk about use of bronchoscopic valves for prolonged air leaks. In Europe, it's becoming more and more common now to find that people are using valves for stopping air leaks, okay? So that's the management of uh, acute air leak using endobronchial therapy. Now we'll talk about bronchopleural fistulas. Is everybody still with me? Are you okay? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Very yes, much. Sir. Is making sense? Yes, yes sir. So, yes, sir. so far, we've discussed three different yes, types of situations. 
the first one was early that is early that is not bronchopleural fistula we spoke about alveolar air leaks we spoke that they usually happen with the bronchus uh, with, with parenchyma of the lung then we spoke about what is a persistent air leak so we tried to understand what is the philosophy of a persistent air leak anything more than 5 days after surgery is a persistent air leak and then now we are in a different world we are talking about bronchopleural fistula these are established fistula between the segmental or the sub or the main bronchus and the pleural space and sometimes even the chest wall so it becomes a bronco pleuro cutaneous fistula so there are all different types of situations and the management of this is completely different and that is why i get very upset when somebody phones me and says sir i've got a patient of bronco pleural fistula for you can you sort him out it is not bronco pleural fistula it is alveolar fistula that is different that it's alveolar air leak that is different from a bronco pleural fistula so it's very important to get the definition right okay so bpf is a communication between bronchial tree and the pleural space and as i said it can also become with the chest wall and uh, sometimes you see them happening spontaneously uh, in patients with tuberculosis who develop pneumothorax and the chronic inflammatory condition uh, post operatively you do see bpfs almost all of us there is no surgeon who can tell you that he has not had a bpf almost all of us have had bpfs and the rate can vary from 1% to 15% of your cases okay so it really depends on the type of surgery that you're doing i mean if you're doing 100 lobectomies for lung cancer In, in, in for stage 1 lung cancer there's less chance that you'll get a bpf but if you're doing lobectomies for tuberculosis for inflammatory diseases then there's a high chance that you'll get a bpf okay so the etiologies are various uh, there are risk factors pre operative intra operative and post operative risk factors uh, the pre operative risk factors are steroids i do not like to operate on patients who are on high dose of steroids i really avoid them quite dramatically i i want to make sure that the steroid is at least down to less than 10 of prednisolone per day it is mandatory if they can stop it it's even better so i don't like steroids i don't operate on active tuberculosis that is my other philosophy i will operate only if i i can give you at least 6 weeks of anti tuberculosis therapy that's mandatory for me of course sometimes you are pushed into it because the patient got massive hemoptysis and is life saving that is a different situation but most of the times minimum 6 weeks but maximum as much as possible defer the surgery because surgery is not the treatment of tuberculosis medicine is the treatment of tuberculosis malnutrition is a risk factor because we know hypoproteinemia leads to breakdown of uh, tissues uh, active pleural inf- infection is a real issue uh, pre operative chemo radiotherapy oh my god you got to worry about this tissue because there's a high risk that this tissue is devascularized you've gone in and taken the bronchus off and then gradually over a period of time because the vascularity is not good it doesn't heal and then it causes a small bronchopleural fistula which gradually becomes a large fistula and you're in deep trouble uh, other factors are anemia diabetes hypoalbuminemia all are self explanatory intraoperative risk factors for a bpf are uh, right pneumonectomy a right pneumonectomy is been statistically shown to be more at a risk than a left pneumonectomy Uh, if you are doing a second stage pneumonectomy which means you did a lobectomy and then came back to do a completion pneumonectomy you are more at a risk of uh, having uh, bronchopleural fistulas uh, if on table you have used a lot of diathermy around the bronchus and you have denuded the bronchus proximally quite a lot then it it becomes devascularized and may not heal very well uh, uh, sometimes the stapler misfires you you used a rubbish stapler you have reused the stapler uh and it's not fired accurately across or you've used an incorrectly sized stapler that's the other thing you cannot uh, you have to make sure that you use a green for uh, for for bronchus rather than if you use a blue on a bronchus that's not a good idea that that will really uh, not help uh, the sizing is very important uh loss of suture integrity if you've sutured the bronchus and uh, you've not tied it well or or it's a poor quality material then it will break down and you will have uh, you will have a uh, uh, bronchopleural fistula and we spoke about this earlier if you leave tumor behind 
if your resection margin is not R0, there is a very high likely that your bronch, uh, bronchial stump will actually give way. Uh, right is usually more than the left because right has got one bronchial artery supplying it, whereas the left has two bronchial arteries supplying it. So the vascularity of the left is better than the vascularity of the right. Uh, mediastinal lymph node dissection can also devascularize the, uh, the right stump. So be careful about it when you're doing these uh, dissections. Uh, try not to come close to the, to the stump uh, because you will take away the blood supply of the stump. Uh, the left, uh, again, retracts behind the aorta uh, after the surgery. So there is more tissue which collapses on the stump rather than being exposed to the infected pleural space. Hence, left is more uh, protected uh, than the right stump. The right stump lies within the pleural space. The left gets pushed away behind the aorta. So it's almost like having a muscle plaque on it. Uh, so the right stays uncovered almost uh, all the time. Uh, so that's something that you've got to remember. Uh, another thing is leaving a long bronchial stump. You must try and staple whatever you do close to the margin. If you leave a long bronchial stump, you leave a dead space there. And, and if you leave a dead space, then uh, phlegm, and in, uh, phlegm collects and blood clots collect in that uh, uh, long stump. And then they get infected. And then the infected air. Remember, we, respiratory is an open system. You're open to the air. So all the bugs are going into the lung all the time. And if you've got a little area in the lung where blood is collected, it's a beautiful culture medium, and unfortunately, that infects your stump, and that will then give rise to a, a, a bronchopleural fistula. A mediastinal lymphadenopathy can sometimes erode into the uh, area and cause problems. Uh, the bronchial <coughs> diameter, which is more than 2.25 mm, can have more risk of having a bronchopleural fistula. Smaller uh, bronchi don't uh, give way that easily. Uh, and of course, use of blood transfusion. Uh, I think uh, blood transfusion is should be treated like an organ donation. Uh, it does cause immune responses. Uh, and uh, there is many a papers which have looked at the correlation between need for blood transfusion versus bronchopleural fistula. And there has been some association that if the patient has received postoperative blood, he's more likely to be immune compromised and he's more likely to get uh, a bronchopleural fistula. Uh, so it's important to handle the bronchial mucosa very gently. No, don't right. pull and push. Don't grab it with an artery for sale. That's the worst thing you could do. Uh, switch off your phone, yeah, guys. Who, who's this? Just switch off your phone. Okay. So uh, you must avoid devascularization. Don't dissect close to the bronchus. And certainly not with the diathermy because everything has collateral uh, damage. You know, there is always a zone around it where the heat gets transmitted. Uh, don't forget the harmonic is just as bad. It might be less bad than diathermy, but it still has a collateral uh, uh, damage. And be very careful, particularly when you're going around the membranous part of the bronchus. Sometimes those are not picked up uh, at the time of the operation and they give you a lot of trouble in the post-operative period. Um, bronchial closure should always be done without tension. Make sure whatever you're suturing or whatever you're stapling is tension-free and avoid excessive length. So these are the intraoperative factors which will help you to make sure that your bronchus uh, does not leak. Uh, I personally reinforce my stump. I will use intercostal uh, muscle all the time. Uh, when I'm doing infected case or when I'm doing post-operative chemoradiotherapy cases. Uh, I use intercostal because I do it by VATS or robotics. And for me, uh, it's easier to take the intercostal muscle down. I cannot take the serratus anterior. But if you do open, then you can use whatever you're happy with. Uh, particularly, as I said, with pre-operative chemoradiotherapy, I would strongly, strongly recommend using uh, reinforcement of uh, staplers. If you're not suturing regularly, then you're better off using staplers. You, you, it, it's a catch-22. You must learn to suture well, but if you don't use, <laughs> if you don't know how to tie well and things like that, then please use staplers. They are more safer. And surgical volume is important. The more surgery you do, the less is your risk of BPF, uh, because more experienced do you become at handling the bronchus. Okay, so the the expertise of the surgeon is actually a factor which helps to avoid uh, bronchopulmonary fistulas. 
Uh, post-operative risk of a BPF or positive pressure ventilation, I will fight tooth and nail to avoid my patient getting uh, intubated post-operatively. Uh, as far as possible, I don't want the patient to be intubated. Uh, empyema is a risk factor because of the infection. Uh, so doing a lobectomy in the presence of an empyema is a strict no-no. It's completely not recommended at all. So as far as possible, you must avoid lobectomies in empyema and more importantly, avoid empyemas in lobectomy. Uh, because if you get infection in that pleural space, that's very bad news. I don't uh, overload my patients. All thoracic surgery patients should be kept dry. I, the one thing I don't want is pulmonary edema and things like that. And I don't want the patient to go into failure and then end up ventilated and need uh, have the risk of a bronchopleural fistula. Again, in my clinical practice, the chest drain comes out next morning. I have to make sure that the lung is expanded, there is no air leak, and the drain comes out. I am not worried about the amount of fluid that is coming out. There is a paper from Copenhagen which has looked at 600 ml, 700 ml of post-operative drainage, and they've looked at about 700 cases in which they took the chest drain out, even if the drainage was more than 500 ml. And only in two to three patients, they had to put back a chest drain. They aggressively take out the chest drain. The amount of fluid that comes out is no longer an indication to keep the chest drain in. Okay, very important. Because the presence of the drain increases the fluid that is uh, being created in the pleura. So we try to get rid of the drain as soon as possible. And we do not like to transfuse our patients. We are very aggressive. For us, the cutoff is seven. Only if the HB is less than seven, then we will think of blood transfusion. Otherwise, we do not transfuse blood in our patients. Uh, acute, as I said, will be within four days. Chronic is uh, the later one, which come uh, two weeks down the road when you're looking at that. Uh, they usually present with fever, uh, coughing serosanguineous fluid. Some develop subcutaneous emphysema. Some develop tension pneumothorax. Uh, some have prolonged air leak. Some have actually lost the drain and then come back with a new uh, pneumothorax. So a wide variety of things. The important thing is the chest X-ray and the history is diagnostic. The moment you have a post-operative patient coming with fever, there can be only two causes for it. One is empyema and the other one, uh, the first one is of course atelectasis, chest infection, but more importantly is empyema and bronchopleural fistula or the other way around, a bronchopleural fistula causing empyema. So be very worried about it. And the moment you see a drop in the air fluid level, particularly post pneumonectomy, uh, that means the fluid is going somewhere. And if you're uh, the only possible place where it can go is actually the bronchi or bronchopleural fistula. So in a post pneumonectomy, if you've got drop in air fluid level, or in a post op lobectomy patient, you've got a new air fluid level in the pleura, both are suggestive that you've got a bronchopleural fistula. Very early, get a CT scan done and please, please do bronchoscopy. You must not diagnose a bronchopleural fistula on a chest X-ray or CT. Every single patient must have a bronchoscopy, not just for diagnosis, but also to get a bronchialveolar lavage and to get um, and to get a good view of what is happening out there. So bronchoscopy is mandatory. Uh, you can suction out the rest of the lung as well when you do bronchoscopy. So a good toilet may actually help the patient. So this is the post pneumonectomy and see these are new levels. There are multiple levels forming. Something is not right in this chest X-ray. Uh, and, and lo behold, uh, here we are, if you look carefully, there is a fistula about to form in the, uh, in the thing and there is a level. Can you see this level on the side? So multi-loculated appearance of this fluid is not a good sign. And if you look on the opposite side, he's starting to get pulmonary infiltration. And the moment you get these pulmonary infiltrations, that means this fluid is coming out and going to the opposite side. And this guy is in real danger because he will die if this lung goes off. So you're going to very quickly drain this space, put in a chest drain, drain the space, start IV antibiotics, get him into intensive therapy. It's very important to treat this aggressively. This is an emergency, okay? Because the other lung going off is, is a disaster in a pneumonectomy. So it's very, very, very important to start working. Sometimes you get these fistulas coming out from the skin a bronchopleurocutaneous fistula. Uh, look at this here, you've got a collapse consolidation. Something is not right, the lung is not expanded and there is a loculated cavity. All of this are suggestive that things are not going right and, and, and he's not doing very well. And in fact, you can see a chest drain on the other side as well, which means he's probably had a large 
pleural collection and uh, you know things are not going well for this patient uh, this is the sort of sinuses that you get a chronic uh, tuberculous fistula which is probably originating from the leakage of the bronchus or the lung if it is left behind and then the tb thing erodes into the bone uh, causes uh, osteogenic tuberculosis and then they leak out as as a cold abscess so quite a difficult difficult situation when you have these uh, pleurocutaneous fistulas uh, following this so you must when you're dealing with chronic uh, fistulas like this you must do a sinogram because you really want to know where the tract is going and many many a times it will not be just be one tract but there will be multiple tracts going in and in this particular patient there was one sinus on the side ear as well and he had had a previous thoracoplasty as you can see this is all collapsed because of the previous so recurrence from the sinus is always a problem so when they come with these things they are real issues social issues uh, uh, you know sexual issues with their family life psychological issues and then of course the chronic sepsis nutritional depletion multiple surgeries in the past and many local debridements all of these are technically a real challenge and you have to treat these people aggressively the answer is you must be aggressive in your management so first and foremost whenever you got a bronchopleural fistula make sure you drain the affected side drain it you must get the pus out you must control the sepsis do not attempt to close the fistula until and unless the sepsis is under control and then you think of doing something for the pleural cavity or that fistula okay uh, so the thing that you do is you go in there later on with surgery and you have, might have debride the bronchial stump you might have to close the bronchial stump and you might have to fill in the space with a good muscle flap or omental flap and i'll show you that in a minute so this is a chronic infected space in the chest wall probably because of some fistula here but there is now the suction therapy available this is a vacuum suction therapy you put in the uh, sponge and then you connect it to this vacuum suction and then uh, you leave it to heal over a period of time you have to repeatedly uh, take the vacuum out and with with time you will find that the cavity gradually starts to reduce in size uh, antibiotics start to take hold and very often you might get away without uh, doing any radical surgery for these patients so this is a new technology in the market which can be used for uh, for a chronic infected space of the chest uh, you might want to do something called as a claggett's window which means you do a, a, a window on the side and allow the pus to drain out you might also want to do something called as an elozer flap and i'll tell you the difference between the two and then once you've got control of the infection you might later on want to use muscular or omental flap and the last uh, option available to you is a thoracoplasty where you might drop the whole chest wall to reduce that uh, large cavity uh, bronchoscopic management is anecdotal uh, there is really been no randomized control study for management of a bronchopleural fistula but uh, works for small fistulae but the recurrence rate is quite high and i'll tell you about the ones that i have done uh, we have used a variety of things uh, you can use a blocker you can use a synthetic agent in that area or you can use a valve all three of them have been tried for management of bronchopleural fistula i have personally used the seal a few times now uh, a colleague of mine has used cyanoacrylate glue uh, my worry with cyanoacrylate glue is it it sometimes uh, damages the bronchoscope as you try to bring it out so it's it's quite it's quite uh, expensive when the bronchoscope gets damaged tissue at least you can wash out so but you've got to be very careful that when you inject the tissue through the bronchoscope you must never pull that catheter back into the channel of the bronchoscope you got to leave it outside beyond and pull the whole apparatus out so that no agent gets into the uh, bronchoscope so this i showed you in that endobronchial surgery these are the sort of infected pneumonectomy spaces that you got so when you go in there you actually use a brush and erode the mucosa so that your sealant whatever you're going to put afterwards actually attaches itself to the mucosa i managed to find a, a video on one of my patients so this was i think a post pneumonectomy uh, fistula and a small fistula at that stage and we went in we sucked it all out and this is my brush going in there and i am actually uh, brushing the mucosa to show you how we do this procedure so you just create a abrasion on that area so that the glue 
has uh, some legs to stand on. And then once you've done enough abrasion, then you uh, get in there with your glue and you inject it. So here we are bringing in with the probe and we are gradually uh, putting in droplets of uh, uh, tissue. You can do whatever you want. There are various uh, things available for plugging this uh, area off. Uh, if it's a small fistula, it works. But if it's a large fistula, it will invariably get coughed out. And that's the worry. So you got to be careful about it. So this is the sort of outcomes that you will get when you put in the uh, TC, okay? Uh, the other uh, literature available for endoscopic devices, are, there's a nice paper from Pune. This group has done about 12 cases and they have actually come up with a nice flow chart. And they, they, this is a pulmonology group, I think. And uh, they've used endobronchial coils with sealants uh, in uh, bronchoscopic fistulas less than four millimeters. They have used ductal occluder devices in uh, four to eight millimeters. And they have used an ASD implants device uh, plus a covered stent, uh, tracheobronchial self-expanding covered stent for fistulas more than eight millimeters. And, and I was surprised to read this paper because they have got patients who are actually now at 24 uh, months following the procedure. These are post tuberculosis chronic fistulas, and they are 24 months post-procedure, some of them, and they still have uh, closure of the, of the fistula and no recurrence. So, uh, you know, uh, but it's not been published in a proper, uh, you know, big journal. It is one of the smaller journals that this paper has been published. So sometimes, uh, you know, when you have good results like these, you must have the courage to publish it in international journals so that we can, you know, give use this uh, as, as a standard for uh, future uh, devices. Let's look at uh, other surgeries that are available to you. So a Claggett window. Claggett window is like a rib resection and uh, drainage. Uh, you create a window to allow the pus to come out. This is from the ESTS textbook. Uh, so you make your incision, you dissect out the area, you make a cut on the rib and uh, take out uh, one or maybe two ribs. Here he has cut three ribs. So it's usually a much larger cavity, Claggett window. And, and it allows the pus to drain out and gives you an acute control. And at the end, you just put a stitch to, to epithelize the edge of the, of the, of the, the, the thing. And then uh, these Claggett windows are usually used as, as, a, as a temporary measure. You're hoping that over a period of time, you would be able to close these. Uh, uh, you know, this is just to temporize the patient, get rid of the sepsis, get the patient fit enough, and then continue medical therapy. So uh, the NITDR guys do a lot of these uh, window procedures and they, they swear by it and they've got very good results. Uh, I have listened to Dr. Givan talk about his experience and they've got very good results with Claggett windows. Uh, so the difference between Claggett windows and LSR flap is Claggett window is a larger uh, area. You really want to get all of the pus out and it's a temporary measure for decontamination. Um, and the aim is always that subsequently you will actually close the Claggett's window. That is what you're hoping to achieve when you do a Claggett's window. As opposed to that, when you do an Elozer flap, it's a more permanent drainage of pleural space. It's a smaller hole than a Claggett's window. And this is the description of an Elozer flap from the original paper. So Elozer flap is done with a, a inverted uh, U-shaped incision uh, at the bottom most uh, uh, area where you want to drain. You want to make sure that the drainage is as low as possible. Uh, and then you create this mucocutaneous uh, flap uh, along with the latissimus dorsi. And then you take out the ribs uh, and come as low as the diaphragm and then push in that uh, U-shaped window into the, into the cavity so that you create uh, a flap. The flap goes in. And so you do not get closure or epithelization of this flap. Uh, so this way, this stays open longer. Uh, in fact, uh, the design of it originally was uh, that it should stay open for life. Uh, but there are a lot of social issues with these. And, and I'll, I'll take you through some cases. Uh, this uh, is uh, really a disaster story of a young girl. And I'll tell you about it uh, in a minute. Uh, so this is the sort of flagged window. But it is not great for the patient's social life. Because look at the amount of erythema that is happening around here. Look at all these encrustations and look at the number of pericotomies he's had, multiple surgeries. 
And this young lady, uh, unfortunately, was a doctor actually. And uh, she went in for a resection of a small tumor in, the, in her first MBBS. And that got infected. And subsequently, they had to do a lobectomy, subsequently a pneumonectomy, eventually ended up with a uh, LSR flap. And, and the whole thing continued to drain pus all the way till her final MBBS. And I saw her in her internship when she said, I want to do MD medicine and I want to get married, but I cannot get married with this window. And I'll tell you her case in a minute. So let's go through this. I, whenever I am dealing with a case like this, I will always do it with my plastic surgeons. I feel that these patients have only one chance. I know I can take a, a, a muscle flap. It's no big deal, but the plastic surgeons are doing it every day. They understand the vascularity of these structures. They treat the tissue different from the way I treat tissues. So I will always do a combined surgical intervention with the plastic surgeons. My aim is to get rid of all of that sinus, completely debride that pleural space, and refashion that uh, bronchus. I want to close the bronchus on table. And then, if needed, I might complete the lung resection, whatever is left behind. And our most important is to close the stump properly and put a muscle flap onto it. And then my plastic surgeon uh, colleagues will get in. So for flaps for stump sinuses, I use an intercostal muscle pedicle. If serratus anterior is available, good enough. Pericardium or fat, whatever is available in that area. If it's a post pneumonectomy space, I do use the phrenic muscle pedicle. I, I cut off the phrenic and I swing it around along with the vascularity and a little bit of fat and use it as a pedicle on the, on the stump to cover it. Uh, that has dual advantage. One, the diaphragm comes up, so the scarity goes down. And so it's easier to fill in the uh, space. Uh, and then sometimes you can use diaphragm as a, as a rotational flap. So you can actually incise the diaphragm, part of the diaphragm, not full thickness, half thickness and swing it around onto that uh, pedicle. And sometimes you might even use thymus if it is available in that area and if you can get into that. The problem of using, uh, of trying to do something with the stump is that there is always fibrosis in that area. And if it's a post pneumonectomy, it's almost impossible to know where is the pulmonary artery stump next to the sinus. So trying to refashion the stump or trying to refresh the edges or trying to put sutures through the stump never works because the risk is that your suture may go through the pulmonary artery. And if that happens, you will lose the patient because there is no way you can get into the uh, into the pericardium because this is all stuck. It's all a badly infected cavity. So I try not to refashion the stump. I actually take a pedicle muscle and I will put it back on there and plug the stump. That is my preferred strategy. I use a muscle pedicle and plug the stump. And then uh, I do rib resection to maximum whatever is needed, uh, but never ever use mesh or synthetic material, never ever. These are infected spaces. You must not use any synthetic material. The reason why I do these with plastic surgeons is that my plastic surgeon assures me that you debride to maximum, I can fill any hole in the chest. I am confident of filling any hole. So when you are with somebody like that, you become more aggressive in your approach to taking care of infection. And then my plastic surgeon comes in. He will vascular. He will take out anything. He'll take out muscle, pedicle. When we go in, we try to harvest whatever is left behind, latissimus, uh, pectoralis. Uh, he will do the reconstruction. And then we always close primarily. We've done this in, in a, at least 20 patients now, and we close them primarily. And, and we've had good results in all of them. So far, we've never needed to use a free flap, but that option is also available to you if you need it. Uh, the, mus the muscle flaps that we use are latissimus dorsi, but the problem is they have been damaged by previous thoracotomies. Uh, we use pectoralis major muscles. We use serratus anterior, uh, if available. Uh, sometimes we use rectus abdominis. So we can flip any of these muscles across into the cavity. So this is a large incision that you do. Then you harvest the muscle, uh, whatever is available on the surface, and then you roll it into that. That's the strategy. So I'll show you some cases which we've done. But the important thing is this muscle flap must come on the fistula, but try not to take stitches on the bronchus. This is, 
this is intraoperative but i don't take any stitches on the bronchus i'll just fix it to the surrounding tissue so that it just plugs into that area okay uh, so this let me show you a case like this this is the sinus he's had multiple surgeries in the past uh, he's also had a, a partial thoracoplasty but the sinus has come back uh, not great uh, situation for him but i know that the sinus is just the tip of the iceberg it is going deep inside i've done a sinogram i know exactly what is the situation there's osteomyelitis in the seventh rib osteomyelitis in the first rib so you inject all these sinuses with methylene blue you harvest any residual latissimus dorsi but the most important thing is all tracks have to be followed to the bone and there must be an aggressive surgical resection so you got to take everything out and then you take all the muscle see all these sinuses coming from various areas you take all of this out and then you put everything back in and these patients then do well i have followed this guy up about 6 uh, years down the road and touch wood so far he's not got any recurrence and and you know everything is healed uh, there is a technique called as a transsternal repair of uh, of the bronchial stem in a pneumonectomy uh because when you come from the side you really cannot see where the stump is so there is a design where you come in from the midline sternotomy you go in you put snoops around the aorta and put snoops around the svc and you open it up when you open that you actually see the bronchial stump and you restaple it proximally much proximally so that you get a healthy tissue see here they have restapled it much proximally and dr bull has done a few of these cases and i listened to his presentation and they have got really good results with this technique so instead of doing everything on the side in the infected area he goes into the midline and and he does that and he refashions the whole stump and puts a staple line proximally and that helps you to get a good control of the bronchopleural fistula uh, we use omentoplasty extensively in all our cases uh, we will harvest the omentum and the omentum can reach a very long area so we 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 sling it in a subcutaneous tunnel and bring it into the uh, from the lateral side into the chest and then we push the uh, omentum completely to block it so here is a 17 year old guy with even sarcoma uh, had some uh, chest wall surgery had some mass repair got infected complete mass inside claggett window and for many uh, many a months he was uh, struggling with all his problems uh, secondary to decortication lobectomy and really in a bad way and we went in into the chest and uh, we opened up everything really deprided it completely uh, completed the rest of the lung resection and then uh, my plastic surgeon got me the omentum beautiful piece of omentum he slung it in a subcutaneous tunnel across from the abdomen and then we placed it in there and we used whatever local muscle we had to cover it and and this patient went home without any uh, problems and he is now i think 7 or 8 years down the road and he's never had any recurrence with this this is the young lady i was telling you who had pneumonectomy had bronchopleural fistula elezor flap draining for 5 years real disaster real disaster and she came to me and said i want this out and then we went in uh, again same concept i did a bronchoscopy see it's very difficult to find the fistula when you go from the side because it's all infected and pus is there and there's adhesion so what we do is we do a bronchoscopy and under vision of the bronchoscopy we pass, pass a guide wire across the stump fistula and once you pass the guide wire across the stump fistula you then intubate and get on with the surgery leave the guide wire in place and then when you go from the side by thoracotomy then it's very easy to find that guide wire and once you find the guide wire you know exactly where that fistula is and all you have to do is plug the fistula so you debride the rest of the tissue and this is you're pushing it from uh, the uh, the guide wire uh, from the bronchoscopy and then you can see the guide wire on the other side and then when you get into theater you you harvest whatever you have to we took the intercostal muscle flap we had residual latissimus dorsi uh, we did a laparotomy got the omentum out as well uh, again uh, you know everything was uh, closed uh, everything was cleaned up again as i said you cannot suture the fistula because you don't know where the artery is this is the important uh, bit that you have to remember it's it's a messy area and the last thing you want is bleeding so all we did was push the stump muscle onto the stump and then push the uh, omentum across through and through a subcutaneous tunnel came into the chest 
and then here is the momentum coming from here the muscle is coming from this side you can see the muscle coming from this side and so this is the muscle covering the fistula this is the momentum covering the entire chest cavity and then you close it primarily the key thing is to close it primarily and we are so happy to know that this girl has now actually done her masters in uh, md medicine and uh, you know eventually hopefully she will get married uh, sometime in life so look at the outcomes five or six or seven years she was struggling with this and here she is completely gone and doing very well so the last thing to talk about is thoracoplasty uh, thoracoplasty dr rajan santoshan gives one of the best lectures on thoracoplasty he's got a video uh, which he has uh, he which he has published a beautiful video and this is actually from the ESTS textbook uh, which the chapter on thoracoplasty is actually written by rajan santoshan so this is directly from that you you make a large thoracotomy go into the subperiosteal area and dissect out all the ribs depending on what is the level that you want to do you can do 2 to 7 ribs depending on whatever level you need to get to cut the ribs posteriorly cut the ribs anteriorly and take out the whole all of the ribs in one place and then dissect in the extra pleural space and allow the whole chest wall to collapse into the chest this way the whole chest wall collapses into the chest and actually obliterates the space and the cavity and he's got excellent results with these technique over the years but of course uh, now with the modern uh, medical therapies uh, the incidence of tuberculosis is treated more and more medically and uh, with the intervention of these other uh, techniques like la muscles and omentums and things like that uh in a lot of places the incident of thoracoplasty has gone down but in india they still continue to do thoracoplasty and they still have very good results uh rajan santoshan and uh, dr divan both of them have excellent results with thoracoplasty and even uh, shri krishna in bangalore uh, has very good results with thoracoplasty and they published them uh, and i've seen them and i'm quite impressed with the way they do these surgeries in my personal practice i don't see these sort of patients and i really uh go more down the route of the plastic surgeons and me getting together to close it so really these are very very difficult problems to treat these are patients who are in deep trouble uh, but you've got to be aggressive you've got to be multimodal therapy multi surgeons uh, you know plastics and thoracics together the bottom line is if the surgeon is worried about reconstruction he will not do adequate uh, resection so that is why i always do it with my plastic surgeon colleagues it's harrowing surgery uh, i think it has had its toll really tb surgery i have paid a big price but my wife is happy so it's okay thank you very much guys <laughs> okay i'm going to stop share now i have a whole chapter tremendous so your microphone is off i think okay did you guys hear my talk or you didn't hear my talk we, no we did we heard we heard your talk sir um, hello yes sir was we, it off all the time got the talk sir yes sir yes. audible sir audible. audible audible no i didn't talk for 2 hours and nobody listened no no no, no, no sir no <laughs> it's a large just 2 seconds okay okay yes, so thank you thank god for that i was suddenly worried that i spoke for 2 hours and nobody heard <laughs> <laughs> In okay all right journey. tell me so did this make sense yes yeah actually i'll, I'll take questions now now i have a whole chapter on uh, i have a whole chapter on intercostal drain insertion which i will not do today of course but i really think that you guys must uh, 
know all the possible questions on on chest intercostal drains it's very important and if you if you don't answer these questions in the exam you look so foolish so i will do that one of these days you know i, I prepared a whole talk uh, and i was surprised how much you can actually be based on we'll talk about it another day today i'm happy to take questions i'm so happy to see dr babatosh on the on the crowd namaskar sir uh, <laughs> Namaskar, Jamil sir. How are you, sir? Uh, I have been enjoying your lecture. Oh my God! Don't tell me. I didn't realize. <laughs> <you're> such, <sir. laughs> I was, I questions. Was, we'll take questions, guys. Namaskar to both of us. Ah, namaskar. Namaskar, namaskar. So we'll take questions, guys. Anybody's got any questions you want to namaskar. ask? Namaskar. Anybody's got any questions, or you're happy? Jalil, Ibril Khali, tell me. Yes, sir. Ah. Yeah, my my question is about uh, the why why the use of uh, sorry why the root of taking the um, the graft from the omental omental through the subcutaneous tissue. I saw, I used to know in some of the texts, they pass it through the diaphragm into the chest. Yeah, I don't we know try why to avoid doing it on the diaphragm because the you, you try to avoid doing it through the diaphragm because you have a risk of uh, risk of herniation. So the hernia is a form in that area. So we, we actually, okay. we do go it slightly anterior to the, to the, uh, to the uh, diaphragmatic muscles. Uh, we try not to make a hole in the diaphragm. That is uh, because these are infected cases, and I don't want infection to get into the abdominal cavity. That's why we try not to. We try to keep the diaphragm intact. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, this is Abha. Yeah, hi, Abha. Tell me. Sir, I had a question regarding the grading of LP. Uh, you mentioned two of them. One was the serfolio grading, and the other was the Mascherini grading. Uh, and there was another grading which uh, just kind of, which I do not remember. Yeah, I don't. I also don't know the name of that one. I read in some paper, but I forgot. Uh, right, sir. So uh, you mentioned that uh, countable and stream. Do, uh, is it still being practiced? Are we still? Uh, do we still have to do it? Uh, in, no. in the okay. All right. It's just for information's sake. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's exam. just for exam going people. Right, sir. Right. Okay. Thank you. In case Dr. Babatosh asks you that question in the exam, then you should be able to answer. <laughs> right, right, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. Sir, I have thanks. a question, sir. Thanks, thanks, Jamil, sir. sir. Ask yes, sir. Me? Sir, I want to ask you. Yeah. Sir, I wanted to ask whether all MPIMS need to be treated or there is any size limit for MPIMS. Can we omit some MPIMS without surgery? The treatment of empyema is medical. That's the first principle. So you start them on antibiotics. You see how they are getting on. And uh, most of the times, uh, a lot of these empyemas will resolve with medical treatment. It depends on, uh, you have to give them adequate antibiotics. Uh, and if it's a tuberculous empyema, then give them at least six weeks, eight weeks of uh, antibiotics. Uh, post of uh, tuberculosis therapy, and then I repeat the CT scan. If it looks as if it's healing, then I don't go in and operate. So I, I strongly believe that the treatment of empyema is medical, not surgical. Uh, but of course, uh, a lot of these guys don't resolve, and particularly when you're dealing with uh, chronic fistulas and things like that as a root cause, then then usually they will not resolve till you surgically do and so on. But as a philosophy, the treatment of empyema is medical. So, in case of chronic MPIMS, chronic when, MPIMS, yeah. when they, the people have completed ATT and uh, they have already taken all the antibiotics and they don't resolve, can we um, leave so, some uh, MPIMS? There are two reasons why I will do the MPIMS surgery in a chronic MPIMS. One is when they are symptomatic. That means they are still getting recurrent fevers and things are not solving and they are not happy in life. And like the second thing is when these guys have to travel abroad, particularly the young guys, who are looking for uh, UK, US visas and stuff like that, they cannot go around with chest x-rays uh, with pus and the intestines. So that's the other indication. That's a patient-driven indication. But uh, if he's healed and it's just a small empyema which is loculated in one area, there is no reason to operate. You don't treat the x-ray. 
you don't treat the, you know, you, you just treat uh, the patient. If he's clinically unwell, if there's a reason to operate, I will operate. Otherwise, I don't operate. Many a times Thank I you, tell sir. the patient, no need for surgery. Thank Would you put a big tail, sir? In, in, in an infected patient, yes, but pigtails don't work very well for a Okay. I'm not a fan of pigtails. But you always start with the basic medical management. So the pulmonologist will do all these things. He will fiddle around. <coughs> he'll put in a pigtail, he'll put in a drain, whatever. Eventually it comes to you, you operate, and the patient gets well. So most of the time they are, they are messed around by the pulmonologist for weeks together before uh, it comes to you. Yeah, anything else? I'll be sure yes, to be a sir. Sorry, who's that? Sir, good evening. Hello, uh, Vivek. Sir, Hi, good evening, Vivek. Tell me. Good evening, sir. Just uh, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture, sir. Just a quick question, sir. Um, so, uh, first thing is, sir, like, uh, uh, when do you recommend, like, uh, or if at all, the use of an underwater seal drain? Um, or is its use getting less uh, and less with the advent of digital suction okay. and a flutter bag? Th thanks for asking me this question. Um, I I will I'm going to take a talk on on intercostal drains and the use of underwater steel and the philosophy behind yes, how sir. to use an underwater steel. So let me answer that when I do it during that. Talk. In this situation, yes. all my patients have. Uh, underwater seal. If I don't have a Madila available, uh, then I will use an underwater seal. I don't like those bags. They are not great. I don't like to use the bags. I will use a bottle. I use a rocket underwater bottle. Uh, I don't like those more complicated uh, atrium and all that. They are very complicated to manage. I use a simple rocket bottle with an underwater seal. I always want to only when I've connected into a flutter valve, then in a flutter valve, we don't need an underwater seal. It's just an empty bag because there is a one-way valve. So nothing can go back into the chest. So you're not worried. Yes. So uh, one more question, sir. Uh, sir, but, uh, like in the uh, case of these, uh, uh, like the two procedures with the open windows, sir, uh, like um, since it's open to the atmosphere, the pleural cavity, um, like if the patient doesn't make good efforts with like spirometry and all that or mobilization, I mean, it could just lead to a chronic wound which will never heal, no, sir. Hello, sir. Right, right. can lead to a chronic wound, but but the experience with the TB people is so strong. Uh, you know, Dr. Devan, Dr. Shri, all these guys tell me that they have very good results. And if you see their data, it's quite convincing. And so you know, it's a good way to get out of trouble. Uh, it's a cheap operation. It's a simple, you know, doing a window is not a difficult operation. Dr. Babatosh will give you more details about this because he has seen a lot more people than I have. Sir, are you, are you there? Dr. Babatosh, can you tell him about the, about the benefits of a target window? Hello, uh, Jameer, uh... sir. Hello. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Good evening, sir. Hello. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Uh, hello. See you, yes, audible. Sir. Hello. We can yes, hear sir. you. Audible. We can hear you. Uh, we can hear you, sir. Uh, you have relearned the spoken. This this group of patients, this group of patients of long standing tuberculosis, totally damaged lung, elosus slab and plug it, both are beautiful, brilliant surgery. We have got a large number of follow-up patients and uh, uh, it needs a lot of patience. Uh, somebody who has seen it, who has done it. And in our country, fortunately, unfortunately, we get large number of these sort of patients and uh, most of them do very well. Final outcome is very good, including thoracopathy, which is supposed to be forgotten art now. And we get a good number of patients with multi-drugs and tuberculosis, everything done, and finally, they end up with uh, thoracoplasty. And uh, I'm very happy that Jameer has stressed these procedures, and uh, these are still relevant. These surgery are not optional, they're all relevant. Not Thank you, Jameer, for highlighting all these important issues. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next question. 
Sir, good. Hello, sir. Yeah, who's that? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello, good evening, sir. Just identify Par yourself. Doctor Par Solanki, sir. Yeah, Doctor Solanki, tell me. Sir, one or two questions I have. Uh, yes. Which suture do you prefer in open technique, sir? When do you go for lobectomy or pneumonectomy? And is it important the suture which is being used yeah. to prevent thing, a BPF? Okay, okay. The one thing part that you must not use is silk. Okay, silk you must not use. Then depending upon what you want, I personally have a lot of experience with using PDS. For me, PDS is an excellent uh, suture material for the bronchus. But yesterday in the talk, Dr. Rajan was actually telling us that he uses Vicryl and he's got very good results with Vicryl. So either Vicryl or PDS, whatever is available in your theater, it does matter what suture material you use. You do not want to use a silk because silk will stay there and irritate the mucosa for the rest of his life and high risk of it giving way. Uh, whereas these, uh, you know, Vicryl or PDS, they dissolve away with time and they don't cause chronic granulomas and things like that. So preferably Vicryl or silk for the bronchus. A Vicryl or PDS for the bronchus, not silk. And sir, uh, you know, when we are doing a redo procedure, then which one is preferable, a Vicryl or PDS? Sorry? In case of a redo procedure, when yeah. we are closing a BPF, which one is preferable for redo bronchus closure? Vicryl or PDS? Anytime, any, any bronchus that you are going to suture, if you are going to suture, then you have to use a Vicryl or a PDS. But as I told you, in a redo procedure, when you go in there, everything is infected. It is all fibrotic. You cannot see the bronchial stump very clearly. And you cannot see where is the pulmonary artery next to it in a pneumonectomy. So personally, I don't suture that bronchus. I plug the bronchus. I, I plug the bronchus with a muscle pedicle and then fill up the rest of the space with either omentum or muscle or whatever is available. So I try not to put sutures on a infected bronchus. Oh, okay, thank you, sir. Uh, and one more question, sir. Uh, uh, one minute. Uh, uh, sir, one more question. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah, go on. Sir, uh, which one, one minute, technique... One, one minute, one minute. Just, part, just wait. There's a very good question raised by Dr. Faisal Islam. He said, what about polypropylene? Should never be used on the bronchus. Never. Silk really? and proline should never be used on the bronchus. Okay. Thank All you. right. Next question. Yeah, Dr. Sir, Solanki. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, which technique do you prefer to close bronchus? Single, uh, single layer or double layer, sir? I sir, because uh, some old timer surgeons uh, generally prefer two layers to close bronchus. So they prefer I, I, two I personally, I use stapler as my first choice, and if I have to close, I close the bronchus with a single layer. Uh, you can okay. put as many layers as you like, but I feel more sutures. On the bronchial stump will give you to more will give rise to more complications because if you close it too tight, you will cause devascularization of the bronchial stump. So I use just a single layer of sutures, four or five stitches across, and I get a good approximation. If I'm worried that this bronchus is not good quality and will not hold, then instead of putting a second layer, it's better to put a muscle pedicle onto it so that you get a double closure. But Two layers of closure is not a good idea, that, in my opinion. People may differ. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. You've got a question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, as per serfolio classification, can we discharge any grade of uh, serfolio classification patient, or is it only the grade one and grade two patients? When you say discharge, what do you mean? Uh, when there is an air leak, you store you uh, in one in the, one of the slides you told us that uh, we can discharge the patient with the hemlic uh, valve. Uh, yeah. yeah. Or so, so, valve. so so yeah, it, it's not a, that is not according to classic. By the time you have decided to put a hemlic valve or a flutter bag, usually the air leak has reduced. So you know, if somebody's got prolific air leak, then the flutter bag flutter valve will not work. 
<coughs> because the capacity of the valve has only this much amount of air it can take. So in that situation, you cannot disturb the patient. Uh, so if okay. it has got a large amount of air leak, you have to think of a plural of a bronchial dehiscence, and you got to go okay. back in. Uh, but usually in the early uh, one stage one, stage two, or say three, you can get away with it. So that is why after connecting the flutter bag, we keep the patient in the hospital for 24 hours just to make sure that he is tolerating the flutter valve. Okay. Uh, sir, and my second question is, uh, what is the clinical significance of calculating the percentage of pneumothorax? <laughs> I have never understood that. I, I don't calculate. A pneumothorax is a pneumothorax. Physicians uh, love all these things. But for me, if there's a pneumothorax, you need to drain the space. That, that is the way I look at it. So I, I only included that in this uh, discussion, in this lecture, because uh, Dr. Adnan specifically wrote to me and said, could you please talk about that? I personally never calculate the amount of pneumothorax. If it is there, it's there. You need to put in a chest drain. That's the bottom line. So I don't know what is the prognostic significance of calculating the percentage of pneumothorax. Uh, sir, uh, uh, my last question is, uh, uh, being a second year resident, when I'm, giving, when I'm given the chance to close uh, the thoracotomy, uh, and when I place the drains, uh, most of the times when we turn the patient, I find that the drains are posteriorly placed. Uh, and I, when I place it anteriorly, they're too anteriorly placed. So uh, in the lateral position, is there any landmark to place the drains? We generally put two drains, one basal and uh, one uh, apical. So anterior apical, posterior basal, that is what? And the second thing that you can use is actually use a curved drain. So for apical, you use a straight drain. And for basal, you use a curved drain. There is a curved drain available in the market. And so when you put a curved drain, it will always curve towards the diaphragm. Okay. You understand Thank that? You, That's sir, sir, I'm only a always sir. anterior, apical, posterior, basal. Somebody is asking me a question about uh, multi-loculated empyema. Uh, any use of interpleural uh, streptokinase. There is a lot of study which is looking at streptokinase as, as an agent uh, for uh, adhesiolysis. I personally do not like streptokinase. If I have reached a stage where you have got multiloculated empyema, I can get it better by wax. So, you know, it's a simple procedure, one hour procedure, everything gets cleaned off, all the toxins get washed out, and quickly the drain can come out in a couple of days. So personally, I do not allow my pulmonologist to use intrapleural fibrinolytics. But there are some pulmonologists who don't have a thoracic surgeon backing them up. They do use intrapleural uh, fibrinolytics. And there is data suggesting that there is some outcome, but there is no strong data. I really am not in favor of use of intrapleural fibrinolytics. Does that answer your question? Vahaj Ali. Hello, yeah, sir. Hello, hello, sir. Uh, sir, I'm all here, sir. Yeah, I'm all. Tell me. Puneet has uh, raised. Sir. After yeah, you, Puneet yeah. can come in. Yeah. Come uh, in, Amol. Sir, uh, sir, this is regarding thoracic injuries. Uh, when a patient comes and when we put a tube inside and there is a leak from that tube, uh, how to infer whether the air leak is from uh, alveolar air leak or central airways uh, are injured and uh, there is a bronchopleural fistula and the air leak is coming from there? How to di diagnose it and See, how to go about it? Okay, Amal, most of the times, uh, it is the quantity of air that is coming out, which will give you a clue, uh, in trauma, in trauma. Uh, usually, uh, if it's a central injury, then these guys are much more sicker. They're much more sicker, more ferocious. The leak is much more aggressive. Uh, everything starts with a chest drain. You put in a chest drain, you try to vent that area, and then you do a bronchoscopy. And under bronchoscopy, if it's a proximal tear, either in the trachea or the right main bronchus or things like that, you will see it. If it is distal than the right main bronchus, then you look clinically at what's happening in the chest drain. And it's, it all comes with experience. You, you can't say, there is no way to know whether this is coming from the alveola or it's coming from the bronchus. So the mechanism of injury is quite important. If he's got rib fractures, I know this is coming from the alveola, it's coming from the parenchyma. If he's not got rib fractures but profuse uh, air leak, then it is more likely coming from a central airway because of acceleration, deceleration injury. So it's a multiple factor. There is no one way to know 
uh, how where the leak is coming from. But 99% of the times it is parenchyma, not central bronchus. 99%. So common yes, things sir. common, it will be parenchyma, not central bronchus. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, then in case of uh, in case management also goes in the same way, like if All it is central and chest yes, drain <laughs> yes, whatever sir. you do, and chest drain followed by bronchoscopy. Yes, sir. And if Stabilize it is a peripheral one, peripheral one, then we will wait. And if it is definitely central, then we immediately go inside yeah, and repair so it. Maybe you have to wait one or two days, and if it is not getting better, it's increasing. Then you think maybe there's something yes, wrong with the central airway. So you don't have to, you might not jump in straight away. Uh, you might do it a day later or something. It depends on how the patient yes, is. Sir. Okay, okay sir. next you, question, sir. guys. Uh, who was that? Yes, Puneet sir. Was uh, that? Uh, yes, yes. sir. My question was, uh, sir, my yeah, question Puneet was regarding, by, yeah. yeah. My question was regarding removal of chest tube after lobectomy, sir. So okay. usually we are actually waiting for uh, uh, chest strain uh, to come down to 200 or less than 200, sir. But um, you mentioned today, sir, about uh, more than 600 read. or 500 also. Yeah. Puneet, so please, sir, throw some lights, sir. You have to read the new papers, Puneet. Yes. Look at the paper published by the Copenhagen group. Okay. Okay. Things are changing quite dramatically. In, I, I was of this opinion uh, when I started uh, practicing uh, training in thoracic surgery. I had an old professor and he would never allow us to take out the chest drain till the uh, amount became less than 50. <laughs> so, okay. you know, imagine for amount becoming less than 50, the patients were in the hospital for two weeks. So, it, it all, everything is changing now. And with bats and everything coming in, uh, you know, dramatically the, the, the scenario has changed. It's the ph physiology, you have to understand the physiology of the plural space. But uh, if, you, if that is your comfort zone of 200, so be it. Uh, why don't you do a study and see for your next 100 patients and see what happens. Uh, if your uh, degree of putting back in chest drain is high, then don't change your practice. But if you find that you don't need it, then uh, why, why put in a chest drain for an extra day? It does increase the drain uh, dwell time by at least two days. This concept of waiting for 200 does increase it by two days. If I'm doing inflammatory disease and things like that, or if I've done a hydrated, then it's different. I know that the fluid is going to come and last for a longer time. If it is lung cancer for uh, malignancy, uh, and I know I've not done a lot of pleural dissection, you, you, you are okay, you can take the drain out. Most of this data is from lung cancer patients rather than inflammatory patients. Okay. In inflammatory, you wait a little longer. Okay, sir. thank you, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Fitun, Fitun had next yes, question. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, actually for the proline, uh, I didn't understand why you cannot use proline for bronchial suturing. I, I, didn't, hear, I didn't hear the first part. For the proline, for using proline to suture the bronchus. Can you hear me, sir? Never used proline. Never, never. So why? Because it stays there for the rest of your life and forms granulomas. Okay, that's why. And the yeah, other they, question. They never, yeah. never, never resolves. It's okay for vessels, okay. but not good for bronchus. People don't use the proline. There are some people who use proline. Some, yeah. like most of us who teach, we, we, we don't use proline. We use PDS. But there are people okay. who do lung transplants with proline. With yes. the proline. Again, the problem is, you know what, Fitun? If you've done yes, a sir. lung transplant with proline okay. and you get a stricture, you cannot dilate it. I you understand see. that? Because the proline yes. will hold it down. You need a suture to go away. The role of the suture is just to approximate A to B, not okay. for strength for the rest of the life. The strength has to come from the natural fibrosis and healing of that bronchus. That is why proline is a problem. Okay, thanks. And the other question is, uh, someone asked about the use of uh, fibrinolytics. So even you are against using not the tryptokinase, but like actiles uh, for pediatric, no, like no, we no. had no, that's I'm different. Not it. one minute. I'm not against okay. using it. There is okay. not enough data to support the use of fibrinolytics. In, in pediatrics? In pediatrics, yes. Pediatrics, okay. if there is data in pediatrics. That's yes. the only okay. situation where it's okay. But again, okay. Uh, you know, it's okay for uh, for early empyema with multiple loculations. Uh, streptokinase will work. 
but in, yeah. in a chronic empyema to expect streptokinase to work is 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 a disaster so acute empyema early empyema small children with multiloculated you know septations that's different uh, yes. that you do medical treatment but uh, vats has become so safe and most of us do this single port man one incision we go in camera goes in for these multiple log you break everything down suck it out and most importantly you wash out the cavity so all the toxins that are there in that pleural cavity get washed out and dramatically the patient becomes better next morning you know you see the patient is starting to feel better so i am a great proponent of surgical intervention the pulmonologists have seen the results so they refer them early now they don't bother with fiddling around but if you don't have a thoracic surgeon you have to do what you have to do and if you have like you don't have easy access to vats like you cannot do routine vats then you would go for the thrombolytics for the fibrinolytics yeah, right if the pulmonologist wants to use it uh, it's okay i i am against surgeons using fibrinolytics <laughs> my problem okay. is surgeons use fibrinolytics i am completely against that i think that is stupid okay i'm against surgeons using fibrinolytics it's okay if if physicians use it Uh, it's not your business to use fibrinolytics and all all that the medicine people should do it why are you doing it never wait and see is is better to open and see than wait and see <laughs> if you don't even if you don't have access to access to um vat and an incision a muscle sparing small incision on a child is a very very small incision and it heals beautifully so you can you can just breaking down loculi is no big deal So actually we had recently like did a study on 100 patients mm -hmm. with pediatric thoracic empyema. So mm -hmm. they all of them only like there was only one case who we needed to convert to thoracotomy. Even the stage 2 and the 3 empyemas they completely Excellent. did well with the um, actilis not streptokinase. If you've got that data, if you've got the data publish it and I'm happy to change my thought. Not process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about to be published, but I go with data. I, but I, you know, I have to be convinced that what you're doing is good science. Yes, of course. But I'm I'm happy. I have no problems with use of fibrinolytics. But okay. if it has to be used, I think pulmonology should use it. But we are surgeons. <laughs> we should yes. operate on the patient. True. <laughs> if I start fiddling yeah. around with fibrinolytics, then for God's sake, what what next? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate right. your answers. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Okay. Who's next? Somebody else raised the hand. Sir, uh, Bishwarup here. Yeah, Bishwarup. Tell me. Sir, if there is an uh, we are doing a decortication for an empyema, and uh, primarily after decortication, the lung does not come up on table, and we have done some hand ventilation, the lung is still not coming up. So, do we do a thoracoplasty and come out, or do we uh, give a drain connected to a section, wait for a week, and then uh, take a call? Don't jump into thoracoplasty straight away. It's better to wait for a little while. Thorac and how thoracoplasty can be done ideally. How long do you wait, ideally, sir? Even even Rajan says that that Dr. Santosham says it that uh, you know you should drain it, give the lung a chance. Very often we also see it that uh, we do by vats. Sometimes the lung doesn't come up. You put in a drain, connect to medulla suction device, mobilize the patient, do physiotherapy, and in three, four, five days the lung comes up. Give the patient a chance. Uh, and, I, I think decortication is worth waiting. Then we just jump in and do the. Can we wait maximum, sir? What is the maximum duration we can wait? As long as the patient is patient and your patient, <laughs> you can wait. I don't think there is any time duration for for you to wait or not to wait. Thank you, sir. If the patient is okay, the problem is most of the time the surgeons get restless. They want to do something, and uh, it takes more experience to know when not to do things. the younger the surgeon i find more aggressive they are they want to get in and operate that is the bottom line the older you become the more you have to say you know i know this will get better yes. so i i run the thoracic surgery group and so many times people write to me saying patients are still uh, you know still bubbling still bubbling i tell him you go and have a cup of tea man you need to relax you are the problem not the patient if you settle down the patient will settle down and then two days later he writes back to me saying Thank you very much, sir. The patient settled down. So you need to learn to be patient, but it comes with experience. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next question. Anybody else? Danesh has got anything to ask? Uh, good evening, sir. Danesh here, sir. Uh, Who's that, sir? 
so did you use uh, negative suction in all these are failure grades or in the grades less than 3 only because the negative suction will steal the tidal volume if it is greater than more than grade 3 That's a good question i i see it depends on whether you believe in suction or you don't believe in suction the people who don't believe in suction don't use suction at all and they have got good data to support their practice i use i use suction in almost all cases the only place where i don't use suction is in a pneumonectomy patient because i've clamped the drain and number 2 in an lvrs patient in an lvrs patient i try not to use suction because i'm worried that the lung is very fragile and pulling the lung up to the chest wall will tear the lung so those are the only two situations in my clinical practice where i don't use suction but uh, if you are happy with not using suction don't use it for any of the drains i'm not sure which is a better way to be really honest it's not yet clear so have you have you faced any problem if the if it's more than grade 3 and patient is deteriorated because it is stealing the tidal volume of the patient uh yes it means you have got a big leak somewhere it means your bronchus has given way and you have got to go back in and stop the bronchus okay sir yeah. thank you sir this is a big leak somewhere major leak. no if how, the how putting compromise the whole of the tidal volume is going away then this is a big leak somewhere how putting a suction is going to make it worsen sir if a leak is big it is without suction also it is big only it worsens the surgeon's uh, state of mind rather than physiology right. Right. it is just I'm not sure yes, how it works they, they, people think that you're sucking so everything is coming out into the suction device and so the tidal volume is going the reality is that if the leak is big the leak is big and that's bottom that's line right. Right. Have to go there. but but very often we are panicked you know with all these things so we don't know what the hell is happening okay next question anybody else any more questions happy one question sir do you use the okay sorry sir dr faiz dr faiz yes sir i think i have got to ask for long duration when i was a resident and still the answer it is remain unanswered to me i think it will help all the residents i attended a patient while i was a resident patient mm -hmm. attended me i was in the midnight i was attending the patient alone there was bilateral emphysema patient was looking like an incredible half and i did an x ray in the midnight i found simply pneumo meristem no pneumothorax so just out of my own to get rid of i just put two drains on two side of the chest in the morning the patient got rid of and they, i uh, uh, reported to my to boss professor rajak sir uh, it's it's maybe before you know 15 years back and mm. uh, you said you did a miracle but i it remained unanswered to me still today <laughs> very good very good can i ask you a question was this patient a drug abuser uh patient was very lean uh, but later on it turned to be but the initially patient came as a incredible half you know when the things were drained and uh, i also next morning i tried to make some little steps but it was discouraged but the two, two drain on also either side it helped that's that's exactly what it is brain is done but that's miraculous very good recovery so but there was pneumo mediastinum commonly pneumo mediastinum is seen in the following conditions number 1 is if he is a drug abuser okay cocaine abuse is known to correlate with spontaneous pneumo mediastinum number 2 is uh, medial emphysema which has ruptured into the uh midline and you get pneumo mediastinum and number 3 is tear of the esophagus or a leak from a retropharyngeal abscess all of these will actually come down into the mediastinum and cause a pneumo mediastinum okay dr khalil dr jibril khalil and some yes sir so do you do you use uh, unipotal rats for this procedure such as uh, the closure of of this uh, fistulas or use regular rat thank you uh for what operation are you talking about the the closure of uh, of uh, for example fistulas and uh, so you do it? no 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 those are done by thoracotomy you can't uh, try fiddle around with rats 
okay. Because you are getting momentum, you are getting intercostal no. muscle, you are getting latissimus dorsi muscle. So all those are done by done by thoracotomy. Okay. I see very small small ones. You cannot close using wax. Endobronchially, you close it. And if okay. you don't, if it's a post-operative lobectomy and you've got a leak or pneumonectomy, you've got a leak, attempt to do it endobronchially. And then if you can't do it okay. endobronchially, then I don't think VATS has a role in that situation. You, you really need to fill up the whole infected space with the healthy tissue. You know, you've got to be sensible about uh, what you're doing and uh, where you're getting it. If you're talking about empyema, that's a different world. Empyema, we do by VATS. All my empyemas are done by VATS. There was a phase in life when I was doing a lot by uniportal, but I don't do it anymore because I'm a robotic surgeon. I use many ports. I'm comfortable. And I've not found a benefit of uniportal just as yet. Diego talks all over the world. All the young people are jumping up and down. But personally, I do such a good, jo good job with the multiport vats. I don't see the need to change to uniportal because it's not dramatically changing the quality of my surgery. And I want to be in my comfort zone. So uniportal versus multiport is a completely different, uh, <coughs> and I have no problem with anybody wanting to do uniportal. That's perfectly all right. I personally don't do it because it's my zone. All the minor operations I'll do with uniport, but uh, you know, lobectomies and things like that, I prefer to do multiportal. I'm very comfortable with it. Sir, uh, I'm Siddharth, sir. Is there any role of bro broncogram for air leak, sir? Not really. Thank you, sir. Not really. I, you know, injecting, injecting dye in a infected patient is not a good idea. I, there's no role of bronchogram actually. Nobody uses a bronchogram. Bronchoscopy, yes, not not bronchograms. It will never tell you where the leak is. Textbooks talk about injecting methylene blue and all that. Yeah. Never works. Yet. If you have to use it, then use the balloon occlusion technique and. Uh, you know, put in an endobronchial valve. That's different. But uh, bronco, bronco gram, no. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Happy? Everybody happy? Yes. Yes, yes sir. sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah. So, fine. Uh, it's a good topic. I think uh, it is something that you face every day, almost everybody. Yes, sir. Yes. I, I, I... I actually committed tomorrow uh, for you guys. So uh, let me see if I can finish writing off on thoracic anesthesia. Then uh, I will do it tomorrow, 5 o'clock. Sir, financial management also, sir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is in personal time, man. That is he is more interested in too. Very, very, very important time. topic, sir. But that one, we is, really need that. A very, very. That is a very personal time talk. It, it is it's very close to <laughs> This month, we are not going to get salary, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Really? <laughs> Maybe. You need that. Huh? Okay. At least we are lucky. <laughs> because... To not work, but get paid. <laughs> because... no, I am, I am in, a, in a containment zone. I cannot go out of my lane. My lane has been sealed. <laughs> because don't take out stocks. <laughs> You come. <laughs> come here. <laughs>